Welcome one and all to the ultimate survival guide for Minecraft 1.14. In this video I will be showing you all the survival relevant changes to Minecraft 1.14 and just in case you are coming back to Minecraft from a bit of a break playing the game I also have ultimate survival guides for Minecraft 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13 and today we'll be covering the 114 changes. So because this update is so large, I've decided to split the video up into five different sections for you all, depending on what you want to watch, or you can just watch the whole video straight through and get the full experience. So timestamps for these sections will be in the description, uh, but let's just go through them really quickly. So the first section will cover all the new blocks, the new recipes, and the new items added in this update. The second section will cover all the new mobs and mob changes in this update. The third section will focus exclusively on villagers, the changes to villages, and also the raids in villages. The fourth section will be all about new world generation and where new items can be found in the game. And the fifth section will be miscellaneous changes, including a lot of crazy stuff which you might not have seen before. So definitely check that one out. So anyways, let's go ahead and get started with the first section. So let's start off with new blocks, new recipes, and new items. The first blocks that are new we're going to be taking a look at are the smooth varieties of some common blocks. So we have smooth regular sandstone, smooth red sandstone, smooth stone, and smooth quartz. And the way you get these is basically you smelt the blocks you see up here and you get the blocks down here. So for instance, if I were to go ahead and put regular sandstone into a furnace, you can see it smelts right up. And eventually I end up with a smooth sandstone block right here. So that's how you obtain the smooth sandstone and the same thing with the red sandstone, the stone, and the quartz here. Now you might be wondering what's the difference between the quartz and the smooth quartz. The difference is this border here on the side is not present in the smooth quartz. So this is the regular block. You can see the border and the smooth quartz. There is no border. It's a nice and clean border right there. So uh, yeah, those are four new blocks added to the game in this update. In addition to the smooth variants of these blocks here, we also have many new stairs, walls, and slabs added in this update, which I'm going to go over now. And before I get into this, I just want to say that the recipe for all the stairs, walls, and slabs is exactly the same for all these recipes. So the stairs are just made via this normal stair recipe like this. So blocks like that, you get your stairs out. Uh, then we have slabs, obviously three blocks across like that, get you that. And then your walls six blocks in the crafting table like that gets you your walls and there's also a new block which you can use to craft these things as well which we'll get to in a moment but let's go ahead and go over all the blocks and stairs and wall variants so we have stone stairs stone slabs andesite stairs andesite walls andesite slabs polished andesite slabs polished andesite stairs diorite stair wall and slab polished diorite stair and slab granite stair wall and slab Polished Granite Stair and Slab, the Mossy Stone Brick Stair Wall and Slab, the Mossy Cobblestone Slab and Stair, the Smooth Sandstone Stair and Slab, and also the Cut Sandstone Slab. Uh, and just to show you the difference between the, sandstone, the Smooth Sandstone Stair and the regular one, uh, this is the Smooth one and this is the regular one right here. Uh, same thing here with the Red Sandstone we have, so we have Smooth Red Sandstone Stairs, Smooth red sandstone slabs and the cut red sandstone slab. We have smooth quartz slab and smooth quartz stairs. The red nether brick stair, wall, and slab. Endstone brick stair, wall, and slab. We have brick walls, prismarine walls, the stone brick walls, the regular sandstone walls, and then the regular red sandstone walls. So those are all the new slab stairs and walls added in 114. Nether brick wall is a block that has also been added in this update as you can see and the recipe is just as you'd expect so six nether bricks in the crafting table like this gets you nether brick wall however that conflicts with the 1.13 recipe for nether brick fence so the nether brick fence recipe has actually changed and it's now four nether bricks in a crafting table like this and then two individual nether bricks in the center. Um, so that gives you your nether brick fence. So just wanted to make that note. Nether brick wall is a little bit different because it also affected the old recipe for nether brick fence. Signs for every wood type were also added in this update. So we have the spruce sign right here. We have the birch sign, the jungle sign, the acacia sign, and the dark oak sign. And these are crafted as you would expect, just like this with the correct wood in the crafting table for the sign. Uh, if you don't have the correct wood or if you have one wood of another type, you'll see it will not craft up the sign. So be sure you have the correct type of plank to make the type of sign that you want. And another interesting thing about these signs are that they are 
uh, more easily editable, editable. So if I go ahead and just t type in here, let's say, hello, you'll see I can actually use my mouse cursor to go back and edit the uh, the, the entire text. Uh, and so, yeah, the same thing here. I can go through and just put in spaces or put in whatever else I want. Signs also have copy-paste support now, so if I do Control-V to paste in whatever I want, I can just do that really easily and go through and make edits that way in the sign. And in addition to that, you can also now dye signs. So let's say this sign here is looking a little bit dark with the default black text. I can change it to white by simply right-clicking on the sign with a white dye in my hand, and I can change the other ones. Let's say change this one to green. There we go. Let's change this one to red. Let's change this one to purple. And let's change this one down here to white. So that's how you can change the text on your signs. There are four new dyes in the Minecraft 1.14 update. They are blue dye, brown dye, white dye, and black dye. And these replace the lapis lazuli, the cocoa beans, the bone meal, and the ink sacs that were previously used to dye items. So you'll see here if I wanted to say, let's craft up blue terracotta. See, it sucks blue dye into the crafting table instead of using the lapis. And if I try and put lapis in there, nothing happens. So basically this blue dye replaces the lapis lazuli, just makes it a little bit more consistent with the other dyes in the game. So the way you obtain these dyes is how you would probably expect. You can craft up the lapis lazuli into blue dye, you can craft up the bone meal into some white dye, you can craft up the ink sacs into black dye, and you can still craft up the cocoa beans into brown dye. So there's just an extra crafting step you have to go through. However, there are also some new sources of these dyes. Uh, one new source is the corn flour, which is a flour which is found in the plains biome. You can craft up the corn flour into blue dye, so that's a new source of blue dye. There's the lily of the valley, which is found in forest biomes, which you can craft into white dye, so that's a new source of white dye. And then we have the wither rose, which is dropped from mobs killed by the wither, which are not undead mobs, uh, and that gives you your black dye. So those are some new sources of dyes in the game. By the way, in case you're wondering, here's what the new flowers look like. So here's what the corn flower looks like right there. Here's what the wither rose looks like right here. And by the way, the wither rose, be very careful when you're close to it, because if you get too close, you'll see you actually get the wither effect. That also applies to other mobs that get too close as well. And then the lily of the valley looks like that when placed down. Now these three flowers, as well as all the other flowers in the game that are one block tall, can also be used in a crafting recipe to make a suspicious stew. So let's go ahead and show you how to make that. It's actually not in the recipe book. Uh, you see right here it only shows mushroom stew. But if we go ahead and place a bowl, a red mushroom, a brown mushroom to make mushroom stew, and then add a flour before we actually craft it, you'll see that we get a suspicious stew right here. And we can add any flour we want to, and the different type of flour will add a different effect. So let's just go ahead and add, for instance, the azure blue right here. And let's make one more. Let's add also the, let's say, the lily of the valley, for instance. Um, so, yeah, if I go ahead and eat this one, this is the azure blue one. So if I eat this one, you'll see it actually gives me blindness for a couple of seconds. So, yeah, got blindness effect right there. So that is pretty cool. That's the first effect, uh, the first blindness effect that we can actually get in survival. And if we, yeah, then eat the stew that the, uh, the lily of the valley was created with... Then you'll see, yeah, we get poisoned for 11 seconds. And so, yeah, that is an interesting effect right there. So here are all the flowers you can add to Suspicious Stew and the effects they give. So Oxide Daisy gives regeneration for 7 seconds. Corn Flower gives jump boost for 5 seconds. The Lily of the Valley, as we saw, gives poison for 11. The Wither Rose gives a wither effect for 7 seconds. All Tulips give weakness for 8 seconds. The Azure Blue, which we saw, gives blindness for 7 seconds. Allium gives fire resistance for 3 seconds. The Blue Orchid gives saturation for less than 1 second. Uh, it's a couple ticks, uh, which changed from the snapshots. Uh, the Poppy gives speed for 5 seconds, and the Dandelion also gives you saturation for less than a second. So, those are all the effects you can get in Suspicious Stew, and Suspicious Stew can also be found in Shipwrecks at about a 57% chance. So, be very weary if you come across some Suspicious Stew. Next up, we have a new weapon in Minecraft, the crossbow. So it looks like this right here. And the crossbow is kind of unique in that you can load it up. So if you hold right click until the string is drawn all the way back and then release it, you can see it's now loaded with an arrow. And then you right click again to shoot it. So 
The crossbows can actually do more damage, have a little bit more range, but they do take longer to charge than a normal uh, bow. But the advantage is that you can keep the crossbow loaded even if you switch off of it in your hotbar. So you see if I switch back to this crossbow, it's still loaded. Uh, and if I switch to the arrow and then back, still loaded. So yeah, you can basically load up a bunch of these crossbows in your inventory like I'm doing right now. Let me just put this one right here so I can quickly switch between them. And so this allows you to do things like, so if you go into battle, you know, you can switch to your crossbows and then boom, 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 right there. Rapid fire, pretty much. Uh, and then it does take a little bit longer to reload the actual thing like that. So that is the crossbow, new weapon in the game. Now the crossbow is also unique because it can actually fire rockets. So if I go ahead and load a rocket from my offhand right here, yeah, you can see the rocket now loaded. And again, it can be stored uh, in the crossbow here. So if I go ahead and just shoot this now... There you go. So whenever it hits a solid surface or an entity, it will explode. So for instance, if I hit this pig right here, boom, it explodes right on the pig and it does do damage. And you can actually do a lot of damage if you have a rocket like this, for instance. Uh, these are just uh, one explosion, but these have seven explosions and they do uh, do more damage the more explosions they have. So for instance, if I shoot this at, let's say, Let's see, I don't want to shoot those creepers right now. Let's say we go up here and see if we can see a mob somewhere that might have full health. Yeah, that cow over there. Boom. Cow down. So, <laughs> yeah, that has a lot of firepower, actually. So, yeah, that's also a very useful tactic with the crossbow. And there are also some unique enchantments with the crossbow, which I'll get into now. So the first unique enchantment with the crossbow is the multi-shot enchantment, and as you might imagine, it allows you to shoot more than one shot at once. In fact, three shots, one directly in the center, and then two about 15 degrees separated to either side, so you can see that right there. And this also still does work with fireworks, and in survival this only takes one firework, but you shoot three. So it's actually a really good way to, you know, basically cover an entire area with some pretty explosive firepower. So that's the multi-shot enchantment. Next up we have the quick charge enchantment. The quick charge enchantment has three levels and the higher the level the quicker you can charge a crossbow. So take a look at how quickly you can actually load and then fire. So that's pretty quick especially compared to this where you have to slow draw back and then fire. So and finally, last but not least, the Piercing Enchantment. So the Piercing Enchantment has four levels, one, two, three, and four. And for each level you increase the enchantment, you can go through one additional mob with a single arrow. So, for instance, at Piercing Level 1, you can go through one mob plus one additional mob. At Piercing Level 2, you can go through one mob plus two additional mobs. And that continues all the way up until Piercing 4, where you can actually go through the first mob you hit plus four additional mobs. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to demonstrate this. So if we just load up our crossbow here with piercing four on it. And yeah, we go ahead and shoot all these creepers here. Let's just shift down so we make sure and hit all of them. So we should be able to take all these guys out in one shot. So let's just see if we can do that. Almost. I missed the last guy. So yeah, you can see, yeah, this last guy barely missed. He lives to fight another day. Or does he? <laughs> there we go. That was better. Also, just a quick note on the enchantments for these crossbows. Piercing and multi-shot are actually exclusive, so you can't have both on the same crossbow. Finally, you might wonder how to obtain the crossbow. You can either get it from killing a pillager, which we'll get to once we get to the mob section, or you can simply craft one in the crafting table with three sticks, two string, some tripwire hook, and an iron ingot like that will get you your crossbow. Shears can now be dispensed and will shear sheep that are in front of said dispenser, as you can see right there. And the shears do take durability, but if I try to shear the sheep again, you'll see even though the dispenser tried to shear the sheep, it actually didn't take any more durability. So that is a fairly useful feature, and I actually created an automatic wool farm, which I'll link on the screen now and in the description in case you guys want to build a fully automatic wool farm. Decaying leaves will now occasionally drop sticks. I can go ahead and demonstrate that here if I just go ahead and get rid of this tree here, and this tree will actually start decaying. Uh, to sort of facilitate this, I'm going to increase the tick speed right here, and so we'll have all these leaves decay. There we go. And you'll see 
it did indeed drop a couple of sticks, so actually just one stick from that entire tree, but yeah. On occasion, decaying leaf blocks can now drop sticks. One minor recipe change is that the soup recipes have all been made shapeless, so rabbit stew is now shapeless. I can move these items around and we can still make the rabbit stew. And also the beetroot soup. You can move your beetroots around and your bowl around and it'll still make beetroot soup. The book and quill has gotten some huge upgrades in this update, so let's go ahead and take a look. If we right click, you can see, number one, I have a cursor. So I can actually move back and forth and edit text. Uh, so say for instance I wanted to, uh, you know, previously if I wanted to put in a new line at the start of this page, I would have had to erase the entire thing and then start over. But now I can just take my cursor up here, hit enter, and say, um, did you know, dot, 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 and then go back down. This book is way, let's make that way better than it was. There we go. Another comma in there. Um, so there we go. Yeah, we can edit that. And let's say we wanted a break right there. We can do that as well. So yeah, you have a cursor and you can move around and edit text like that. Uh, you can also highlight text like this. So yeah, you can do that. Uh, you can then, let's say, copy this. And let's say we want to come down to the next line, copy that again, and let's just copy that again. So you can, can copy and paste in the book itself. So that's pretty cool. Uh, you can also highlight a single word by double clicking or the entire page by triple clicking like this. Uh, so that's an easy way to, you know, get rid of whatever you have written or, you know, highlight just certain words. So that's pretty great. And also all the pages. So we have 100 pages now in the written books, which is twice the length that it was before, so really big improvements to the Book and Quill this update. Another item that couldn't previously be used as a fuel source but now can are dead bushes, so dead bushes can now be used as a fuel source. Next up we have the barrel. Barrels look like this, and you can also place them in the opposite orientation like that. Uh, and the way you craft these up, you have six planks and two slabs of any type get to your barrel. Now the barrel works exactly the same as a chest, it has 27 slots, the only difference is that barrels can still work underneath of solid blocks, so see here I can open it and interact with it, whereas if there was a chest underneath of a solid block, I actually can't open the chest, so uh, yeah, that is the barrel block. Barrels are also critical for villages, as if a village has a barrel and there's no fishermen in the village, then any villager who does not have a workstation already has a chance to change their profession into a fisherman uh, when they're nearby the barrel. Next up we have the bell. So the bell looks like this. This is a item that you can right click and you see the bell will actually ring like that. Uh, you can place this either on the ground or on the side of blocks like this or I think you can actually place it, can you place it underneath? Yeah, you can place it like this. And yeah, depending on how you place it, the bell can ring in different orientations or not ring. So like if I click this side, it won't ring because bell's not going to move this way, it's going to move this direction. So if I click this side, it does ring. Uh, so yeah, that is the bell. You can also shoot it with a bow, and it'll ring. So there you go, you can shoot it with the bow and have it ring. And it also serves a little bit of functionality in the village. So if I go to a village, and bells only naturally generate in village, you can't actually craft the bell, but you can trade for it with certain villagers. Uh, and if I go in here and ring this bell, You'll see the villagers start to scurry and they will try to make it into their houses. The bell has one additional functionality besides causing the villagers to scurry. If I go ahead and click this and there's a pillager or an evoker or any other mob that can participate in raids nearby, it will actually cause them to glow for a few seconds. So yeah, that's actually really useful, especially if there's a raid on the village. Next up, we have a new plant in the game, bamboo. Bamboo looks like this. It can grow up to 12 to 16 blocks in height. And if you plant it down, it looks like this initially. And then if you hit it with some bone meal, it'll grow up between one and two blocks every time. Uh, and you can see it also gets a little bit thicker on the bottom here. And yeah, if we keep bone mailing it like this, yeah, there's its maximum height for that one right there. Couple more interesting things about bamboo. Number one, you can chop it down with a sword rather easily. Doesn't matter what type of sword it is, just like that. And then you can actually bone meal the stalk here and it'll uh, it'll grow back, as you can see. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Uh, and then you can also use it as fuel. So one bamboo will smelt up a quarter of an item. So if you have four bamboo like this, this will smelt up exactly one item in your furnace. You can also craft bamboo into sticks, so two bamboo 
uh, gives you one stick just like that. And you can also place your bamboo into flower pots, uh, which looks like that. Next new block we're taking a look at is the Blast Furnace. Looks like this. This block is used by the armor in the villages. And if we go ahead and right click it, you'll see it looks like a normal furnace. Uh, however, it can only smelt up material ores and also tools. So that means gold ore, iron ore, uh, iron tools, gold tools, diamond ore, uh, lapis ore, things like that. Uh, and only those types of things. So, yeah, it's kind of limited in its use, but it also has the ability to smelt much faster than a normal furnace. In fact, it smelts twice as fast as you can see here. So we have two iron ore here, two iron ore here, and we have 64 bamboo in each one of these uh, furnaces, one in the, the regular furnace and one in the blast furnace. If I go ahead and then release this, you'll see this will now smelt up, and that has now smelted one item where this one is still on the first item. Uh, and they actually use the same amount of fuel. This one just does it in less time. So this one's actually now done smelting. And this one is still finishing up. Uh, this one used 8 bamboo. And this one also used 8 bamboo, but it took twice as long. So, uh, yeah, that is the blast furnace. And you can actually craft the blast furnace yourself. Uh, if we just go in here, and we also need some smooth stone, I believe. So if we just get some of this out right here. Crafting recipe is just 5 iron ingots like so. Furnace in the center, and then three smooth stone across the bottom, and that gets you your blast furnace. The next new block we're going to take a look at is the smoker. So the smoker is very similar in use to the blast furnace, except for cooking meats. So basically it smelts up, or cooks up, rather, meats at twice the rate of the normal furnace. Uh, I can just sort of demonstrate this here. If I put two pork chops here, uh, let's put uh, two pork chops here, pump in some fuel here and some fuel here. Uh, you'll see the smoker going much quicker than the furnace right here. So, smoker's already done one. That one has just now done one. And smoker is now done, and the furnace is still going. So, yeah, it consumes the same amount of fuel, but, yeah, again, smelts twice as quickly as the regular furnace right there. And the way you craft the smoker is if you have four wood like this surrounding a furnace, that'll get you your smoker, and you can also use uh, some regular wood like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be the stripped wood variety. Alternatively, you can also just use four logs and a furnace to craft up your smoker. So, yeah, either way you want to do it, wood or logs will work for the smoker. Next block we're taking a look at is the cartography table. Looks like this, so it has like a little globe on it. It has like what appears to be a map and then maybe some ink right there, perhaps. Uh, and, yeah, this thing actually serves as the workstation for the cartographer in the village, the guy who sells maps. The way you craft up the cartography table is just like this. So four planks and two paper like that in your crafting table will get you the cartography table. And there's a lot you can do with this. You'll see if you right-click it, this interface comes up. And let me show you how to use this. So the cartography table can be used for three things primarily. You can use it to copy maps, you can use it to expand maps, and you can use it to lock maps. So let's go ahead and take a look at how that works. So if we open up the interface here, we got two slots here and an output slot right here. So you want to put the map that you want to copy into your top slot here. You'll see yeah, that shows the uh, map right here. And then you want to take an empty map if you want to copy the top one. Put it in the bottom slot and you'll see two maps come up. Uh, and that gets you two maps here. Now you can't actually uh, make more than these. Uh, it only takes out one at a time. Uh, whereas in the crafting bench, if I have one around here, yeah, you can actually copy more than one at a time. So it's actually still better to use the crafting table to copy your maps. Uh, but you can do it in the cartography table if you want. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to expand the map. So to expand the map, put the map you want to expand in the top slot. Then we need a single piece of paper on the bottom here, and you can see, yeah, it makes this area a little bit smaller. And then we take this out, and then, yeah, you can see the map has now been, um, yeah, expanded upon. So that is that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is we're going to lock this map. So just to show you that it's locked, I have a banner named Secret Stuff, which I'm going to place down right here. I'm going to right-click it, and you'll see it says Secret Stuff on there. So, yeah, that's going to be our indication on if the map is locked or not. Uh, so we're going to... Take this map, put it in the crafting table, you can see it right there. And now we're going to place a glass pane in this bottom slot, and you'll see a little lock symbol comes up here. It's kind of blacked out, which might be a bug, but uh, this should uh, lock the map here. So there we go, and this map should now be locked. So um, yeah, if I fly around here, I should not be able to update it. Yep, it's not updating as you can see. 
Uh, and yeah, I can come over here. Should be able to break this banner as well. And yeah, you see again, the map does not update. So yeah, this is a way you can place down markers uh, where there is no actual physical banner. Uh, and you can also do other cool stuff with this, uh, especially considering you can now create maps that don't have any land filled out when you get like to the corner down here. So yeah, that is how you lock maps with the cartography table. Next two blocks we're going to look at are the fletching table right here and the smithing table right here. So these two blocks currently have no uses other than uh, uses in villages. So this one's used by the fletcher as a workstation. This one's used by the blacksmith as a workstation. Uh, but those are the only uses it currently has. However, you can craft both of these in the game. So if we go ahead and look here, the fletching table is made with two flint and four planks, just like that. And then the smithing table is made with two iron ingots and four planks just like that. So, uh, yeah, there is, is no other functionality for these blocks, but Mojang have hinted that they will add functionality for these in the future. Next up, we have a very unique block. That is the stone cutter. So it looks like this has sort of a spinning blade here, and you can craft this thing up in here. If we just go in here to stone cutter, three stone and one iron ingot gives you the stone cutter. And this is used by masons in the villages. And this also has some right-click functionality. If we just right-click on it here, uh, and we put in, let's say, some cobblestone here, you can see yeah, all the blocks we can craft from that. So we can get slabs, stairs, walls. Uh, if we put in like some mossy stone bricks, uh, you can see we can get some other stuff here. Uh, we can also, uh, for instance, if we put in stone, go right from stone to stone bricks, or even to chiseled stone bricks, so it eliminates some crafting uh, headaches that you might have to go through. Also, I just want to point out that using the stone cutter to craft stairs is actually much more much more resource uh, friendly than doing it in the crafting table. So the crafting table way, uh, if we did it this way, uh, like so, you have a ratio of stairs to blocks of 2 to 3, but if you do it in the stone cutter, you get a ratio of 1 to 1. So for every one block, you get one stair. So that's actually a pretty significant resource savings uh, when using the stone cutter to craft stairs and also saves you time uh, crafting some other things. So, yeah, that is the stone cutter block. Next up, we have the loom, which looks like this. And this is actually a really interesting block for banner production. Uh, and by the way, you can craft the loom if you go into a crafting uh, inventory and put down two planks and two string just like that. That'll get you your loom block. So what can you do with this? Well, if you right-click it, you'll see an interface come up. And you'll see a couple of slots here. So we have three slots over here and one output slot right here. So what you do is you take a banner, place a banner in here, and then a die in this section right here. And once you've done that, you'll see a whole bunch of banner patterns come up. These are all the banner patterns which you can craft uh, with the banner and die that you have uh, input into the loom already. So you can see I have, you know, you can make the slant one, you can make the line across, you can make the X, you can make the stripes, you can make the corner. Uh, you can make the border one, there's the brick one, etc. Uh, and so, yeah, depending on what type of die you put in, this will change. And the preview is right here. And then you can just take it out to actually craft it right here like that. Um, so, yeah, that's how that works. And they can go in and maybe, you know, do like a, a something like this maybe. So there's that. So you might notice, you know, there's a slot for a banner. There's a slot for a die. What is this slot for? Well, this is actually for patterns. What patterns are are basically ways to craft up a little bit more expensive banner patterns. So, for instance, those that use the Creeper Head, the Wither Skeleton Skull, the Oxide Daisy, and the Enchanted Golden Apple. And there's also one unobtainable, or I should say uncraftable, uh, pattern, which is the Globe Pattern, which you can only get via Villager Trading at the moment. Um, so, if I go over here, I can show you how to craft these up. So, basically, it's just a item. So, in this case, the Creeper Head and a paper will give you the Creeper Charge pattern. Uh, and then if I come back over here, let's get out another die here. Let's just make it, uh, let's make it a green die like so. So we'll put in a white banner, a green die, and then I'll get my creeper charge pattern and you'll see, yeah, that gives me the creeper face on the banner. Now when you take this banner out, you'll notice that the banner pattern is not consumed. So this is a way to sort of permanently get yourself uh, the, uh, the banner pattern is there. And then the other ones are just made the same way. So like the Wither Skeleton Skull one, uh, just paper and Wither Skeleton Skull give you the skull pattern. Uh, the Ox Eye gives you the flower charge pattern. Uh, the Enchanted Golden Apple gets you the, the thing pattern. Uh, and then, of course, the globe pattern is the brand new pattern. And that one actually 
is kind of unique. And like I said, it is brand new. So here is the globe pattern right here. Gives you sort of like a square on the, like a square globe on the, like a cube on the, uh, the actual banner there. So that is a new banner pattern right there. And that is the loom. Next up, we have the grindstone. Looks like this, and you can also place it on the side of blocks as well as upside down like that. So to craft the grindstone, you'll need two sticks, two planks, and a stone slab like that, and that gets you the grindstone. Right-clicking on the grindstone leads you into this interface right here, from which you can do a couple of different things. So the first thing you can do is you can actually repair items in the grindstone. So if I have two broken items and I place them into the grindstone, you'll see the durabilities here are equal to 27 if you add these up. Uh, but you get a 5% bonus by repairing them in the grindstone. So that is somewhat useful. And also it's worth noting that you can no longer repair items in the crafting table. And the same thing is true in your player inventory slot. You can't repair items no matter which you know orientation you put them in. You pretty much have to use the grindstone now to repair your items. So that has big implications for things like PvP and UHCs. The other thing the grindstone can do is it can actually disenchant items. So if I put this pickaxe with a bunch of enchantments into the grindstone top slot, you'll see it actually can remove all of the enchantments except for the curse enchantments. So you can't remove, for instance, the curse of vanishing or the curse of binding. And when you remove these enchantments, you actually get the XP back from the enchantments, depending on you know how good the enchantments uh, were that were removed. So I got a bunch of XP right there. Another thing you can do with the grindstone is you can use it to disenchant books. So, for instance, if you have a book with not-so-great enchantments, you can just return it to a normal book. One final note is that in villages, the grindstone is used by the weaponsmith as a workstation. Next up, we have ourselves the lectern. Lectern looks like this. So, yeah, it's obviously like a lectern you'd stand at to give a speech, almost like a podium type thing. And the way you craft this is if you have four slabs and a bookshelf, you put them in the crafting table like that, that gets you your lectern. And the librarian in the villages uses this as his workstation. And so, yeah, basically the lectern is kind of an amazing block. It's a redstone functionality block. So the redstone functionality of the lectern. If I go ahead and put it in a book into the lectern right here, you'll see it gives a signal strength of constant output here. And the signal strength that is uh, output by the lectern is determined by where you're at in the book. So if I go further along in the book here, you'll see the redstone signal strength gets a little bit stronger. If I go even further along, it's a little bit stronger still. And if I go all the way to the end of the book, you'll see that, yeah, the signal strength is now at maximum. So it should be at 15 right here. Yep, right there. So that's fantastic. And you'll also notice via the lamp on the side here that every time I turn a page, it also pulses a redstone signal. So that is pretty cool. You can take an output from it uh, that varies with your progress in the book and also uh, get a signal out of it every time you turn the page forward or backward. So that is a pretty cool block right there. Next block I want to talk about is scaffolding. So scaffolding right here can be quickly used to make towers and other things to help you build on like the outside of structures quickly. So the way you make scaffolding is you basically take six bamboo and one string and that gets you six scaffolding blocks. And so scaffolding allows you to go up and down just by holding a space bar to go up and then yeah, if you drop back down, you see you'll actually be able to walk on the surface of scaffolding, uh, despite it having no collision box. Uh, you can also go down by holding shift like that, and you can see I can also walk right through it. So that is pretty cool. Uh, and then basically what you can do now, if I go ahead and go into creative mode to go up to the top here, uh, if I now look at the bottom of the scaffolding block like this, I tower up. If I look at the top of the scaffolding block uh, looking to one side, I'll actually start to pillar out in that direction. And I can go up to six blocks in this direction. And then on the seventh block, you'll see the scaffolding can't support itself. And so the scaffolding block is placed there, but it falls to the ground. Uh, however, if I continue to place scaffolding here, you can see the scaffolding builds up from the ground. So this allows you to easily create more scaffolding. So now I have a scaffolding connection here to the ground and then I can start to basically pillar from this section. So I can now go out this way or I can go maybe this direction here until I get to the seventh block and then once again the scaffolding will fall to the ground and then I just basically repeat that. And then I could go up here, you know, and I could go, let's say, out this way a little ways before I reach the limit there and, you know, so you can create like platforms in the sky easily with this. And then once you're done 
with your scaffolding. You can also destroy the bottommost scaffolding block, and you'll see here that it destroys all the blocks that aren't being supported, so it allows for easy cleanup, uh, much faster than, like, for instance, dirt pillaring would be. One final thing to know about the scaffolding block is that you don't have to be on the scaffolding block itself at the top to uh, place down scaffolding like this horizontally. So if I could just go ahead and shift and go down a little bit here. Let's say I want to place some scaffolding out this way. All I should have to do is look outwards this way and slightly downwards. And I can place a block like that. And so, uh, let's see, and then I'll have to come up here, get on top of this block uh, about right there, and then just continue out this way from this portion. Yeah, like this. So yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to get used to that, but yeah, that's a really cool feature. So I can place that one down there and then it's usually uh, beneficial to come out here like this to continue to pillar out horizontally. Uh, and you can also walk on this even though there is no block underneath of this. So I'm actually like inside of this block here and I can actually walk on the underside of this scaffolding. So yeah, that is pretty cool. The next new block we're looking at is the lantern. So you can see the lantern right here looks like this. You can see it actually sort of flickering a little bit. And as you might suspect, the lantern does indeed give off light. So yeah, you can see that right there. And you can either place it on the ground or you can place it on the underside of blocks like this. And it'll sort of hang from the, uh, the underside of the block. Now, the only place you can't place lanterns is on the side of blocks for whatever reason. So you can't, you know, place it like that, like a torch, but yeah, on the tops or the bottoms of blocks will work. And the way you craft this is eight iron nuggets around a torch like that will get you your lantern. The next new block we see is the sweetberry bush. So the sweetberry bush looks like this when it's in the sapling stage. And you can see here, all it does in this stage is basically impede my movement. So it slows me down a little bit when I go through it. But if I grow it up by simply hitting with bone meal, uh, it does this naturally, by the way. I'm just going to do it with bone meal to speed it up. You'll see now when I walk into it, uh, as long as I'm not moving, I don't take any damage. But if I move, I start to take damage. And it actually just grew up right there as well. Uh, so now it's in the third growth stage right there. Uh, and at this point, I can actually right-click it and harvest the berries from it. So I just got some sweet berries there, and I can, I can actually eat the berries. And that will restore one drumstick of hunger. And then this is the third growth stage. And if I do one more right-click with bone meal, this is actually the fourth uh, growth stage, which is the final stage. So now if I right-click again, you'll see uh, I actually harvest the berries. And you get a few more berries once you reach the final growth stage, if you harvest it then compared to the third one. Uh, so that is that. And you can also, if I just quickly tower up with some scaffolding and just climb on up here, to the very top like this. There we go. And then I just drop off. You'll see I didn't actually take any fall damage, although it does damage you when you start to move through the bush. But these things actually negate fall damage because it slows you down so much, as you can see right there. So yeah, that is pretty cool. But do be careful of these things because yeah, they are pretty prickly and they will do damage to you. Next up, we have a very versatile block and that is the campfire. So a lot of cool things about the campfire. First of all, you'll see it emits lots of smoke, and also you'll see some embers shooting off of it occasionally uh, when you're nearby, so yeah, stuff like that. However, those embers are just aesthetic. They can't actually catch anything on fire. In fact, the main feature of the campfire is that it can't catch anything nearby it on fire, while also aesthetically looking uh, very much like a fireplace, so that is pretty cool. So this is a way to get basically safe fire in the game now. And the way you craft this is you basically need some sticks, a coal or charcoal, and then logs or wood, or stripped wood. So you can like interchange these here, and like I said, you can also put in charcoal instead there to get your campfire. Now the campfire does indeed emit light, so if I change it to night here, you'll see, yeah, it emits some light, and if I put like another one over here for instance, yeah, it emits a good amount of light. Uh, and there's also some other really cool features of the campfire. One of the interesting features of a campfire is that you can actually place a hay bale underneath of the campfire, and that actually increases the height that the smoke particles will travel. And the smoke particles on the campfire actually are visible from much further away than normal particles as well. So if I get, like, really, really, really far away, you see, yeah, you can still see them from quite a distance. So they're really good like landmarks, uh, almost like beacons, but not quite. Uh, but yeah, you can still see that from, you know, we're several hundred blocks away now. 
but yeah, you can see these things pretty much until you get out of render distance. So yeah, those are the campfire particles. So in addition to being visible from really far away, you can also put the campfire out by simply right clicking on it with the water bucket and that water logs it and then you can remove the water again by right clicking with an empty bucket, of course. Uh, and then, yeah, basically you're left with a campfire that is not lit. Uh, and so, yeah, this obviously doesn't emit any light or emit any smoke or anything, but then you can relight it with a flint and steel. So you can light and relight the campfire. And this does mean that you can automate the uh, turning on and off of the campfire. And I've actually made an automatic campfire tutorial, which I'll provide a link on the screen to right now. Now there's a couple other things you need to know about the campfire. Number one, if you stand on it, you will get burned and take damage. But if you sneak, you'll see you'll also take damage and go up in flames. So don't step on the campfire. You'll have a bad time. So a couple final things about the campfire. The campfire can actually be used to cook food. So all you have to do is simply right click on it with some food that can be cooked. And there we go. So yeah, I can store up to four items at one time on the campfire and you can actually see them on the campfire which is pretty nifty. Uh, now you can't actually interact with this via a dropper or a hopper or anything. You actually have to manually right click the food in and the food actually cooks uh, slower. Uh, it takes about 30 seconds for the food to cook uh, but you can put four items in here so per block it's actually faster than a furnace. Uh, and it also never runs out of fuel, so it takes no fuel to cook these things. And you'll see, yeah, once it's done cooking, the items sort of pop off in different directions, and then you can go around and pick them up, and they're all totally cooked. One final thing about the campfire, if you destroy the campfire with an axe, you'll see it'll drop some charcoal like that. However, if you have an axe enchanted with silk touch, you can actually pick up the campfire itself, so you can carry around a campfire in your inventory. Next item we'll be taking a look at is the composter. It looks like this, and if we go into the crafting bench, we can see the recipe for this is four fences and three planks just like that. We'll give you your composter. Now this is also the workstation for the farmer villager, and what you can do with this is if you right click on it with some organic uh, material, you'll see that it'll sometimes uh, compost into uh, this sort of podzol-like material inside the composter. And if you continue to do that, you'll see that once you reach this level, yeah, after a brief delay, it'll actually turn white on the top, and that is because you can now right-click this again, you just remove this campfire here, and you'll get a bone meal out of the composter. So, yeah, you can compost items, and depending on the quality of the item, uh, some items will compost quicker than others. So, like, carrots have a higher percentage chance to compost than seeds, and cake and pumpkin pie and things like that that are really high in value uh, will actually compost every time. So, yeah, different uh, foods and different uh, plant matter will basically compost at different rates. And you can also automate this because the composter is actually uh, able to accept input uh, from hoppers and uh, take uh, the output, the bone meal, from the composter itself. So if I were to say, let's say, put like a whole bunch of carrots in here or something, You'll see, yeah, it automatically composts up. And when it turns into bone meal, it gets sucked out at the bottom. And, yeah, the bone meal is then deposited into the chest. Two more things you want to know about the composter. Number one, the comparator can actually read the composting level of the composter. So as I increase the level here, you see the redstone signal strength increases as the composting level increases. And once we reach the maximum level right here, if I right-click this now, you'll see that this redstone line will actually turn off. And composters can also be moved by pistons, so very useful block indeed. Next new item we're going to take a look at is leather horse armor. So leather horse armor can be put onto your horse just like this. And you can trade for this, or you can actually craft it yourself. So if you want to craft it yourself, you're going to need a crafting recipe like this. So seven leather gives you your leather horse armor. Now you can also dye this leather horse armor a bunch of different colors. So like for instance, I'll make a yellow one here. Let's make a light blue one here with maybe some orange thrown in like this. Uh, let's make uh, maybe another one with some orange thrown in. Uh, let's actually make it quite orange. So let's just do a bunch of orange like this and then maybe a hint of magenta like that. And let's see how that looks. So if we go ahead and right click the horse right here, you see we can take it on and off. So there's the yellow one right there. Uh, and then let's just go ahead and switch this out for the pinkish one like that so there's a whole bunch of different colors uh, and then let's do this one right here there's like a beige one right there so yeah leather horse armor now in the game and also dyeable for your horse 
Now moving on to new mobs and mob changes. So first off, we're starting off with the pandas. So this is what the panda looks like here. You can see there are actually a number of different varieties of pandas around here, including little baby pandas right there. Now let's just go through each one of these normally and I'll just sort of go through each one and the personality traits of each panda type. So first of all, we got the normal panda. This is what the normal panda looks like. Uh, and yeah, you can feed pandas bamboo just like this and they should pick this up and he should eat it, uh, I believe, if he's hungry. Yeah, there he goes. So there you go. They have a nice little eating animation right there. And you can find these guys in the bamboo jungles, which makes sense because, yeah, they eat the bamboo. Um, so that's the normal panda. Next up, we have the worried panda. So worried pandas are kind of unique. They will actually avoid the player and any hostile mobs that are around the area. Um... And they also, um, yeah, will not eat bamboo or cake. So if I, like, throw this guy a bamboo like this, see, he doesn't really, he really doesn't eat anything. He really didn't eat it at all, actually, <laughs> I don't think. So, yeah, he, uh, he doesn't have the eating animation. And also, he's so worried that, like, if it storms, so if I do weather thunder, watch what he does. Watch what he does, this poor guy. It's so sad. Look at him. He's hiding his face. He's scared of the thunder. He looks out. <laughs> he looks out of the corner of his eye like, is it over yet? Is it over yet? So, yeah, he, he's, he's very scared of, like, everything. So, yeah, it's a little bit sad, but that is the worried panda right there. So, yeah, that's that. Um, yeah, then we have the brown panda. So, brown pandas um, are the rarest of the pandas. They're, uh, like, only a very small percentage of all pandas are brown pandas. Uh, but they don't have really too many unique personality traits, except that, you know, they're brown. So, different color, different aesthetic look to the panda. Uh, next up, we have the weak panda. This is the weak panda right here. You can see the weak panda is actually crying, and it has a runny nose. Um, these pandas will actually uh, sneeze uh, more often than other pandas. Uh, they'll sneeze almost as often as the babies do. And when you see a sneeze, like, all the pandas, like, jump, as if they've been frightened a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's that. And they also only have 10 health instead of 20 health like all the other ones do. Uh, so that's the weak panda. Next up, we got the playful panda doing somersaults and stuff. So yeah, obviously playful panda are quite playful. Uh, so they run and jump around and stuff like that. Similar to what the baby does, uh, right here. So this is the baby panda. You see the baby panda just chillaxes on its back and... Yeah, it does baby stuff. Uh, and also has a very small chance when it sneezes of dropping a slime ball. So that's that. Uh, then we have the lazy panda. Lazy panda likes to lay on its back, uh, even as an adult. Uh, so, yeah, that's the lazy panda. They're also... These lazy guys are sn uh, much slower than normal pandas. Uh, and you can tell it's a lazy panda because the lazy panda is smiling. So there's a smile on his face right there. Uh, in fact, this guy is actually the slowest mob in the game, believe it or not. <laughs> so... Yeah, that's the lazy one, uh, and this guy, unlike other pandas, actually won't follow you if you're holding bamboo. So he's like, yeah, whatever, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> so these other pandas, like, will follow me if I'm holding bamboo, but this guy, he doesn't, he doesn't care. Um, so then we finally have the last type, which is the aggressive panda. So this is the aggressive panda, you can see he has, like, mean eyes, and if I hit a panda nearby him, or him, the, the actual aggressive panda... Uh, itself, I can show you what will happen. Uh, let me just change my game mode to game mode survival. So if I get close here, hit this guy, he will attack me back. Same thing if I attack another panda. This guy wants to try and kill me now, as you can see right there. And they do have a pretty big melee range, so it's actually hard to hit them with the sword when they attack you. Um, so those are the pandas. Players can also breed two pandas together, and this is actually quite complex, so I'm not going to go into all the, you know, dominant and recessive genes that are in each panda, and which uh, genes or alleles are basically passed on, but basically know that there's a complex breeding system behind which type of panda you get, um, depending on which two you start with. Um, so, yeah, to breed pandas, you use bamboo, so obviously they follow you when you have bamboo, and you need eight bamboo sticks within a 5x5 five five, uh, region of the two pandas. So if I just now right-click on one with a bamboo, right-click on another with a bamboo. Let's see if these two breed. Yep, there we go. So we got a little baby, baby panda right in there. And let's see what type it is. It looks like it is a weak panda. So, yeah, there you go. That's how you breed some pandas. 
Also, since this is a weak baby panda, we should be able to see this baby panda probably sneeze relatively soon. Yep, there we go. So yeah, every time the baby panda sneezes, the adults sort of like jump, uh, which is a reference to that panda gift from a while back, which you guys might remember of the panda suddenly startled when the baby sneezed. So yeah, that is uh, what that is. Uh, also, if you slay pandas, I'll just slay this dude right here. You'll see, yeah, they drop bamboo. So yeah, that is the panda mob. By the way, pandas also have a unique ability. They can actually eat cake. So if I throw this cake at this guy, you'll see. Yeah, he munches it right up. So there you go. Panda's favorite food is cake. Next up, we have the pillagers. So this is what the pillagers look like right here. So these guys can spawn in a couple different scenarios. Uh, the first scenario is they can spawn in illager patrols, which are basically uh, patrols which spawn within 200 blocks of a village, uh, either on grass or on sand. Uh, and these guys can spawn throughout the day or night, but only after five in-game days have passed uh, in that area. So, yeah, these guys will occasionally spawn right outside the villages, and if they wander into the village, they can start to attack the villagers themselves. So a couple more things about these pillagers. Obviously, they use their crossbow as a weapon, so they don't really shoot too often, but when they do... Uh, you got to watch out because it does quite a bit of damage. Uh, and when they spawn in as part of a Illager patrol, they can also spawn in with Vindicators. So, yeah, they can have Pillagers like these guys with the crossbows and Vindicators with the axes, uh, which sort of terrorize villages around the world. Also, if it wasn't immediately apparent from their look, the Pillagers are indeed a hostile mob. You can see yeah, he draws back his crossbow and then fires at you. So you got to be careful of these guys. Alright guys, so we made it to the Pillager Outpost, and as you can see around here, yeah, lots of Pillagers have spawned in with crossbows and things, so, yeah, Pillager spawning is a lot more frequent around the Outpost than anywhere else in the world. And also, around the Outposts, uh, you get some of the guys that have the banner on their heads. Uh, I believe these guys also can spawn in with the, uh, the Illager patrols. Um, and these guys are quite special because when you slay them, you actually get what's called the Bad Omen Effect, which we'll get into once we get to Villages and Raids. Next mob we're going to take a look at is the Ravager, right here. So this was formerly known as the Illager Beast. And these guys are a pretty powerful, hostile mob that is coming to 114. These guys have 50 hearts worth of health, so that's 100 health points. Uh, they also do 9 hearts worth of damage. Uh... From a single attack so yeah that is a, a pretty good amount of damage now they do only spawn in during raids so they only spawn in uh, from wave 2 and beyond uh, as part of raids and they can also spawn in with somebody riding them although the player can't actually ride the beast uh, ourselves so we can't actually ride these guys but pillagers and evokers can um, so that is pretty interesting. Um, now, I'll just show you guys some of the attacks that this guy has. Uh, hopefully I can survive this right here. But yeah, you can see, first of all, this guy is actually pretty quick. So if I'm just, like, running away from him, yeah, I'm, like, sprint jumping away. And he's still doing pretty well to, like, keep up with me. So, yeah, they can come at you pretty quickly. Uh, these guys, by the way, are... These guys are hostile toward the player, Iron Golems, Villagers, and the Wandering Trader. You see right there, I actually performed a stun attack by blocking the uh, Illager Beast with the shield. But then after that, you'll see he has this sort of yell, this knockback yell. Uh, and otherwise, he sort of like lunges forward and like will bite you. So, yeah, that's sort of what his attack is right there. And if eventually you slay the Ravager, you actually end up with a saddle. So all the Ravagers drop saddles. One other thing you need to be aware of is that Ravagers can actually destroy leaves. So if I drop down here, yeah, you'll see. Yeah, this guy just walked right through that wall of leaves and just destroyed it. So, yeah, be very careful if you're, you know, trying to hide behind leaves or have leaves in a village. Because, yeah, the Ravager can just destroy leaf blocks and go right through them. Another interesting note about the Ravager is that if it walks on any farmland or anything, you'll see it uproots any and all crops on that farmland. Next up, we're taking a look at Stray Cats. Here's one of the Stray Cat varieties right here. Now, Stray Cats will spawn in villages, and they've been totally separated from Ocelots in this update. Uh, so you only can get Stray Cats uh, from villages and the nearby area, uh, not from Ocelots. 
Uh, stray cats uh, will attack things like rabbits, so if I just let this guy go here, uh, maybe he will, if he can see the rabbit, attack it. Yep, there he goes, right there, and I'll also, I think, attack baby turtles. Let me just see if that's the case. Yep, there he goes. So yeah, the stray cats will attack those two animals, so if you're in the vicinity of a village, be aware of that. Uh, now, stray cats will respawn in villages over time. Uh, it's a little bit of a slow process, but they will indeed respawn uh, if you get there and... Yeah, there's, there's none there. Just wait a little bit and they should be up here. Now, stray cats will try to avoid being near the player, so if I, like, run toward this cat, even with the fish in my hand, you'll see the cat just tries to get away quite quickly. So, yeah, don't do that. Uh, but you can tame these stray cats if you sort of slowly walk toward them with either a salmon or a cod in your hand. So I'm going to try to do that here. So let's see if we can get this guy tamed. Yep, here he comes. Okay. And so, yeah, you don't want to startle the cat or anything. And we'll just come on like this. There we go. Yep, perfect. All right, so now we have a tamed cat. You can, of course, right-click to uh, allow the cat to sit down. Uh, and you can also, if we have some dyes, just give myself, uh, let's say, green dye. There we go, green dye. Uh, we can actually dye the cat's collar now by simply right-clicking on it with a dye. So you see I changed the collar from red to green right there. And cats also have some new uses in this update. Alright guys, so we now have a phantom above us, and we have a cat sitting down right here. If you listen very, very closely, you can hear the cat hiss at the phantom. Right there, which scares the phantom off, so the phantom turns around and goes back. And this is good up to 16 blocks away, so like, if I stand over here, phantom won't come attack me because I got a cat nearby me, so... That is a pretty useful feature of cats. They scare off both phantoms and creepers now. Another cool feature of cats is that if you sleep through the night here, like this, you see the cat actually gets up here and curls up with you on the bed. And it sort of purrs here, and then sometimes during the daytime now, uh, the cat will actually bring you gifts. Uh, some of these gifts can include things like rabbit's foot, rabbit's hide, string, rotten flesh, feathers, raw chicken, or phantom membranes. Uh, and sometimes they'll just like drop it on the ground here, so... Yeah, it just sort of depends, like, what they give you, but it looks like I did not get lucky here and the cat didn't bring me anything. Dang it! Yep, there we go. So, yeah, that time through, uh, the cat actually brought me a feather as sort of like a morning gift. Uh, so, yeah, there you have it. Cats can give you gifts in the morning time. You can also breed two cats with uncooked fish, uh, cod or salmon. And I'll just show you, there are a bunch of different cat textures which are new. There are now 11 cats in total. Uh, so, yeah, this one right here, in fact, is the Jelly Cat. Good Times with Scars Cat, now in the game. So, yeah, that is really, really cool. Um, so, yeah, you can see a bunch of different varieties of cats here. If I just get a bunch of them in here. Some new, some you might recognize from previous versions, but, yeah, there are a bunch of different varieties now. By the way, if you slay a cat like this, you'll see they actually drop some string. Another cool thing with cats is that black cats will now spawn in every witch hut. So you can see this black cat right here at the witch hut that is in this swamp biome. So since you can't get cats from ocelots anymore, you might be wondering what happened to ocelots. Well, they're still in the game. You can still find them in jungle biomes. Uh, so if I just go ahead and switch to survival game mode here and then approach this ocelot, you'll see the ocelot is still skittish once it sees me. So yeah, it still tries to flee from me. Uh, but if I hold a fish in my hand like this... And then approach somewhat, somewhat slowly. Yeah, I can actually get hearts to appear like that. And that means that the ocelot now trusts me. So, yeah, I can, yeah, do whatever and the ocelot will not run away now. So here's another ocelot that I found nearby. And if I go ahead and just hit this guy with a fish and this guy with the fish, you'll see. Yeah, these two should breed up. Yep, there we go, and that gives a baby ocelot, and the baby ocelot uh, should already trust me, I believe, although he seems to be running off. No, he trusts me. Yeah, he's not going anywhere, so, yeah, now you have an ocelot that trusts you here, and, yeah, um, that's pretty much all that there is to it. Like, he just doesn't run away. That's the only advantage of taming ocelots now. 
All right, now we're going to talk about foxes. So foxes look like this, and yeah, foxes will spawn in in taiga biomes and snowy taiga biomes. This is what the uh, regular fox in the taiga biome looks like, and we can see a baby fox right here. Now, foxes are deathly afraid of the player, so if I just go ahead and go into uh, survival game mode, you can see if I just walk toward these guys, they just basically flee me at a very high rate of speed, so... Yeah, they don't like to be around players at all, but if you can somehow get a fox nearby, uh, you can breed them. By the way, a pro tip in actually getting close to foxes and potentially breeding foxes is to essentially crouch whenever you're close to one and see one sleeping, uh, because that will actually, yeah, prevent the fox from detecting you when you get close. So if I crouch all the way up to this wild fox here, let's see, I can get all the way up to him and actually feed him with some sweet berries before he actually wakes up. So yeah, I can now feed him and now if I unshift you'll see he instantly runs off into the distance. So that's how you can uh, get foxes, uh, get close to foxes without you know having to like run after them and make all sorts of crazy stuff around uh, the area. So yeah, that's an easy way to do it. So the way you breed foxes, you have one fox here, one fox here, and I'm gonna right click with a sweet berry on one fox right here and the other fox right there, and you'll see this now has them produce a baby fox. Now this baby fox will be sort of a tamed fox, so it actually won't flee the player, uh, at least not as quickly as uh, its parents do. So yeah, you can sort of have foxes that aren't afraid of the player uh, in the baby foxes, and once they grow up they will still no longer be afraid of you. You can also facilitate the growth of the baby fox by feeding it sweet berries. So I'm just going to do that right here until it grows up. So we'll just feed it a whole bunch of sweet berries like this. There we go. So yeah, you saw it right there. It grew up. And yeah, now it's a full-fledged fox, which should not be afraid of the player. Um, so yeah, you can see if I go into survival mode now, the other foxes flee, but this guy sticks around. So this is a tamed fox now uh, that we have just created from the baby fox. Um, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And another cool thing about foxes, uh, if I just go over here and throw a sword at this guy, you'll see foxes can actually pick up stuff in their mouths. So if I just toss this on this guy, there we go. Yeah, he's now holding the sword, which is actually pretty useful because, uh, let's say I have, I'll go into game mode creative real quick, and we'll get a pillager. So let's get a pillager out, pillager spawn egg. This guy, and we'll go back into survival game mode. Check out what happens if this guy hits me with an arrow. You'll see the fox actually starts to defend me. So that is pretty cool, and he can actually use the sword too, which is pretty awesome. Uh, and then let's say I wanted the sword back, I could throw something else at him. Uh, and maybe, if he holds still for a second, we can get that sword back. Because he'll swap it out, potentially. Maybe? No? Okay, how about, how about food? How about, how about a fish? Does he prefer fish? Yeah, he does prefer fish. So you can actually get the stuff back, and there's the sword right there that I gave him. Fox also hunt certain animals, so you can see here they're actually hunting the fish right now, the salmon. Looks like they actually got one back there, but yeah, they don't move too quickly through water, so they struggle with uh, attacking uh, water mobs, although they did get a salmon right there. Uh, in fact, if I put down like a chicken on the side right here, you'll see that the foxes actually prefer to go after land mobs over water mobs. And the opposite is true of arctic foxes. Uh, so I'll just show you this again here. I'll just put down a few chickens, show you how the foxes attack. Uh, so yeah, you can see here, they sometimes jump up and then attack like that. This guy is somehow jumping backwards as well. So foxes also have some unique behaviors. You can see right there, this fox actually just harvested some sweet berry bushes. So he's now holding some berries in his mouth and he's actually eating the berry right there, and he actually ate the whole thing right there. So, yeah, they can go through uh, sweet berry bushes unimpeded, and also, yeah, harvest the bushes, as you just saw again right there. So that is pretty cool. However, do be aware if you give a fox a food item, for instance, like a poisonous potato, uh, the fox will eat it, and let's just see what happens here when he eats this thing. Yep, so, yeah, the fox just ate it, and... Yeah, obviously it's a poisonous potato, so the fox does experience the effects of the poisonous potato once he eats it. And the same goes for any other food item with any other effects. So, 
Yeah, just be aware of that when you feed foxes. By the way, foxes will also attack rabbits and baby turtles. So if I put a fox down here, you see that guy actually spawned in with an emerald, which can also happen naturally. Uh, and then he swaps out the chicken for an emerald. So yeah, foxes will attack rabbits and also baby turtles. However, the foxes themselves get attacked by wolves. So if I put a wolf down here, yeah, you'll see this guy starts to go after the foxes, and yeah, they can pursue them for quite a distance, actually. So, yeah, be aware of that. Uh, also, polar bears, if I get out a polar bear right here, polar bears will also attack foxes. So if I put a fox down, polar bear right here, you'll see the polar bear does indeed go after and attack the foxes. And there also is a white fox variant, the arctic fox variants, and yeah, you can see it looks a little bit different from the regular fox, so yeah, has a white skin and sort of like a bluish uh, hue to the tail right there, so yeah, that's the arctic fox right there. By the way, foxes sometimes will spawn in with things in their mouths, so yeah, this guy for instance spawned in with a piece of leather in his mouth, uh, so what you can do is you can just give them a piece of food, and they'll swap out that for... Uh, yeah, the piece of food. So you can actually get whatever they have in their mouth uh, from them. So that's a sort of interesting thing there. Another interesting thing about these Arctic foxes, uh, they sometimes, when they pounce on an animal like this, will get stuck in the snow. So let's just see if this happens here. That one didn't do it on that one. Here we go. Maybe this one. Yeah, right there. See, it gets stuck. <laughs> so yeah, so they sometimes can get their face stuck in the snow uh, if they pounce uh, while they're on snow. Finally, these foxes are primarily nocturnal animals in the game, so usually they take naps during the day, and then if I go ahead and do time set night, you'll see, yeah, the fox wakes up, and now he's going to go out and sort of like prowl around, basically. Uh, so, yeah, foxes will basically be active at night and primarily sleep during the daytime. There have been some big changes to mushrooms in this update. Uh, so here we have a regular mushroom cow. However, there is now also a brown mushroom cow, and the way you get the brown mushroom cow is in one of two ways. First way is that you can either breed two red mushrooms, that now has a 1 in 1024 chance of giving you a brown mushroom instead of another red one, or you can hit it with lightning, which is what I'm going to do. So we have a channeling trident here. If I strike one of these cows with lightning, you'll see this guy is actually transformed from a red mushroom into a brown mushroom. So what can you do now with these brown mushrooms? You see, if you try to right-click with the bowl, you can get the mushroom stew out. However, if you feed it a flower of some type, for instance, like I'll feed it this wither rose, you'll see some particles came out there, and now if I right-click with the bowl, you see I get some suspicious stew. Uh, and yeah, any further clicks will just go back to the regular stew, but yeah, if I eat this suspicious stew now, it actually has the wither effect because we fed the, the wither rose to the uh, mushroom. And yeah, if you remember the wither rose, uh, when uh, combined with the mushroom stew, will actually give you suspicious stew with the wither effect. So if I eat this now, uh, which I should be able to do if I like jump off of this, for example, um, yeah, I should now be able to eat this momentarily, and you'll see that once I do, yep, gives me the wither effect. So, yeah, that is sort of a secret that is uh, not necessarily known by a whole lot of people. So, brown mushrooms now in the game, and feeding them a flower will get you a suspicious stew. There have also been big changes to the wither mob, in that any mob that is killed by the wither will now have a wither rose spawn in its place. So you can see here, yeah, two sheeps were just killed there, and as you can see there, there's two Wither Roses uh, right there, so that happens with any undead mob. Also, it's important to note that the Wither can no longer see the player while invisible. So you can see right in here, I am currently totally invisible, and this Wither can't see me. The only way he can see me is if I actually hit him. So if I punch him like that, then he'll actually be able to see me. Phantoms also do not see the player now when you're invisible. And the same thing goes for Elder Guardians and Guardians. So you can see I'm currently invisible right now, and yeah, the Elder Guardian doesn't see me, and these Guardians over here also don't see me. Next mob we're going to take a look at is the Wandering Villager mob. So the Wandering Villager looks like this, and so this guy is kind of a unique mob in Minecraft. There's not really been another mob like him. Uh, you see he looks like a villager, but uh, yeah, actually is quite a bit different. So... 
Uh, first of all, these guys can spawn anywhere in the world after about 20 minutes have passed since the world has been created. Uh, and, yeah, they'll continue to attempt to spawn uh, every, I think, 20 minutes or so uh, after that if there's not another wandering trader in the world already somewhere. So only one of these guys can be in your world at any one time. And, yeah, these guys uh, will also despawn after 40 minutes of being in your world. Uh, and they typically come with two llamas, or, yeah, usually two llamas to protect them. Uh, and usually he's holding them with uh, leads, but I just spawned these guys in, so obviously since he's not naturally spawned in, he's not holding them with leads. Uh, but usually they do, and they sort of carry them around with them wherever they go. Now these wandering traders, if we open up their uh, crafting, or their trading window, rather, you can see they offer a couple of trades here. So, yeah, we got some flowers, some, mushroom, some mushrooms, some other flowers, and some blue ice. Now these guys have an absolutely massive repertoire of trades. So just to give you an idea on the diversity of trades these guys offer, if I go ahead and look at this guy's trades, you can see he sells coral, gray dye, red sand, saplings, red dye, and gunpowder. Uh, so not too, not too bad of trades. Also, it's worth noting that when you trade with these guys, they don't actually reset their trades. So yeah, they will never reset their trades. So once you see the X up here, here you can't buy any more of that product from that wandering trader. Um, and also, they only sell things. They don't buy anything. So, yeah, you have to have emeralds on you to trade with the guy, but it does help to uh, trade with these guys in some scenarios. And I can just show you some other trades that these guys offer. So, yeah, here's the guy we saw initially with the blue ice. Uh, this guy has some different trades as well, with some different flowers and cactus and sand. Uh, some other notable trades, these guys can sell... Uh, basically any type of flower, uh, they can sell red sand and normal sand, they can sell uh, any type of dye, they can sell glowstone, sea pickles, packed ice, blue ice as you saw, kelp, uh, podzol, they can sell nautilus shells, they can sell uh, buckets of puffer fish or tropical fish, so a lot of different variety of things that these wandering traders can sell. And they also have a lot of unique characteristics. So these wandering traders are somewhat susceptible to zombies and husks, especially at night, but they do have some things to defend themselves. So if I go ahead and do slash time set night, you'll see that he drinks a potion of invisibility and disappears during the nighttime. So yeah, that's one defense that he has. He goes totally invisible and zombies can't see him when he's invisible. Uh, and then if I go ahead and do time set day, See, he drinks a bucket of milk and becomes visible once again. So that's one defense he has. And also the llamas he has with him usually defend him. So if I go ahead and spawn in a husk here, I think we should see the llamas. The llamas should shoot the zombie or the husk here. Or perhaps not. Interesting. That might be a bug. So this is what I believe should happen. The Trader Llama should attack all undead mobs which try to harm the wandering villagers. So with that guys, we are now moving on to villages, villagers, and raids, and all the changes in regards to those things. So, uh, let's go ahead and start off with the villagers themselves. So the villagers themselves, you can see here, now have biome-dependent skins, of which there are quite a few. So the one you see right here is the desert skin for villagers. Here's the savanna biome skin, so you can see it's a little bit different with the red jacket. For snowy biomes, you can see the villagers are bundled up and they have special hats which cover their ears, so that's pretty cool. There's also a regular taiga, mega taiga, and mountain variant of the villager skins, which looks like this. So we yeah, got a little bit of brown and some beige colors in there. Then we have some of the plain skins, which are some of the ones that you're more accustomed to, like this one here is the uh, generic plains villager right there. There are also jungle villager skins, which you can see right here. Now, these skins are actually not seen in the vanilla game. You have to go out of your way to breed uh, villagers in jungles for them to have these skins. And the same thing is true with villager skins in the swamp biome. Villagers don't spawn in swamps, so you have to actually go out of your way and breed villagers in swamps to get villagers with these skins. So those are all the skins from various biomes, and here's actually an image of every villager skin type per profession. Uh, so that sort of shows you all the different variants of the biome skins and the villager professions. And so, yeah, basically, to make a long story short, the professions have characteristics that persist throughout biomes, but the colors change of their actual uh, dress and their actual garb. So, for instance, the cartographer in the plains has a monocle, and the cartographer in the savannah has a monocle, 
The swamp has a monocle, the snowy biome has a monocle, and the desert has a monocle. It's just the clothes that change uh, from biome to biome. So that's basically how that works. Uh, so let's go ahead and now talk about some of the professions, and we'll talk about the workstation blocks for each villager. So the workstations basically function to provide employment for villagers who are unemployed. So this is actually an unemployed villager right here in the plains biome. Uh, and so they're, they're basically the most basic. They don't have any sort of defining characteristics, and they don't have this little pocket thing that all the other villagers have in various degrees here. Um, so yeah, if the villager is unemployed, you actually won't be able to trade with him. So if I click on him, you'll see he just shakes his head. Can't trade with him. So yeah, that is uh, the unemployed villager. Uh, and if an unemployed villager comes close to a workstation, like for instance, the smithing table is the workstation for these uh, toolsmith right here. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, the villager, if there's no other toolsmith uh, nearby, will turn into a toolsmith villager. So that's how unemployed villagers can become um, employed villagers. They can get a profession assigned to them. So that's how that works. Uh, and also, uh, once they're assigned a profession, they will sort of congregate around their workstation during the day as they're sort of going to quote unquote work. Um, so that's what these uh, workstations are and why they're significant. So uh, you'll also find these in houses. So yeah, if you find these in houses, like, you know, that's the butcher's house or that's the cartographer's house. If you find their cartography table inside uh, and yeah, you'll probably then find the actual villager with that profession inside as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and go through all the workstations for all the villager professions. So first off, we have the toolsmith. The toolsmith has the smithing table as a workstation. Then we have the armorer, which sells armor and things. So the armorer has the blast furnace as uh, the armorer's workstation. Then the butcher has the smoker. The cartographer has the cartography table. The cleric has the brewing stand. Then we have the farmer has the composter. The fisherman has the barrel. The fletcher with the fletching table. Leather worker with the cauldron. Librarian with the lectern. The mason, which is a new profession with the stone cutter. The Shepherd with the Loom, and then we have the Weaponsmith with the Grindstone. And then we finally have the Nitwit. Nitwit doesn't have a block, uh, so yeah, he is just sort of solo. Uh, you also can't trade with the Nitwit, so you see he shakes his head, uh, indicating you can't trade with him either. And then we have the Unemployed Villager down here. So those are all the village professions that you can have in a village. Uh, so yeah, now let's go ahead and go into the village itself and take a look around. So we're now going to talk about the villages and how they've changed. So immediately you can tell that the structures of the villager houses have changed and there's a bunch of different village uh, structure variety. And also the variety in the type of builds and the type of materials in these builds vary uh, biome to biome. So this is the plains biome variant. So you can see here we have ourselves uh, some buildings made with some oak uh, wood and also some oak wood logs and also stripped oak wood logs, uh, and also a lot of cobblestone in these builds. So, yeah, if we just go into some of these here, you can see a nice little house right here with the bed. Uh, we have another house here with the bed. This is probably another house with the bed here. Yeah, we got the villagers out here. They're all meeting around the bell, which is sort of the center of the village. We got some hay bales around here. We got an area for animals over here. This is a mason's uh, workstation right here. So he has stone cutter here, clay, hardened terracotta, etc. And I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but I do want to show you a few of the possible houses, but there are many more possibilities than what I'm going to show here. Uh, this is the leather worker house right here, so leather worker stuff and a cauldron inside there, so that's pretty nice. And of course little farms here with the composter and things of that nature around here. Um, so yeah, this is the Plains Village here, and yeah, here's a wandering trader actually, how about that? So this guy has wandered into the village, and you can see he's now <laughs> he's now holding uh, yeah the leads on these two llamas. So this guy is naturally generated. Uh, I did not spawn him in, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so we have yeah a duplex here with two beds in there and a chest. Uh, somewhat bigger house here with a little bit more room inside here. So yeah, that is some of the uh, plains village structures right here. So yeah, let's take a look at another village type now. So here's a good example of a taiga village. So you can see taiga villages use a lot of spruce wood. So spruce wood logs, spruce wood doors, spruce wood planks. Uh, the beds are also different colors. There's campfires, which provide lighting in these taiga villages. 
Uh, there's also different uh, variations of building uh, in this Taiga village compared to like the plains, for instance. Uh, so there's a couple different houses. Here's where the, the meeting place is for this Taiga village. And yeah, of course you can see the villagers here. There's also some pumpkins around. There's some farms that use the spruce trap doors. Uh, and sort of like a pathway through this farm here, which is a little bit elevated. Um, yeah, you can see actually a baby villager down there. Uh, there's grindstones here. So this is a uh, weaponsmith's house right here. So yeah, you can see some weapons in there. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, you can see this guy has his house down there. Uh, there's some tall houses like this. This is cartographer's house. And yeah, you can see more chests in here. Of course, cartographer's house has maps inside. So that's a little bit of a uh, yeah sample of a taiga village right here. All right, guys. So we're now at a savannah village. And yeah, obviously a little bit different from the other villages we've seen. So yeah, you can see here they're using a lot of acacia planks and acacia logs. Uh, and if we get on in here, yeah, you can see this is actually the weaponsmith's workstation in here with the uh, the grindstone. You'll also notice that some structures here in the savannah are up on stilts, so that is intentional as well. There's also some banners around here. So if we get in here, this is actually the cartographer's uh, workstation in here. And then in here we have a little house here, essentially. Uh, we'll go around to some other ones. You'll see the terracotta is a little bit more plentiful here. And uh, that, yeah, it's used for a lot of uh, buildings, and there's a lot of different colors of it around. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Uh, there's also melons here. And yeah, you see more terracotta in here. This looks like the cleric's workstation right in here. Uh, more beds in here with different colors. So yeah, different variety of things. And also the villages sort of just like feel different. Like they're sort of like built differently in a different style. Here's what looks to be some barrels. Uh, and yeah, there's a house on stilts here. This could be a fisherman's house. Not really much of a house, but <laughs> yeah, there it is right there. So... Yeah, quite the number of different things. This looks like a butcher's house. There's pigs in the back. There's smokers right here. Also a cat right there, a stray cat. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. There's a little farm down here. This looks like another butcher house, potentially. If there's a smoker inside. Yep, smoker inside. So this could be another uh, butcher area right here. So, yeah, that is the Savannah Villages right here. Next up, we see a desert village. So this is what the desert village is looking like here. So we got some rather interesting structures right here. This actually looks really great, I have to say. Um, so if we go on inside here, you'll see some beds. We got some desert materials, cactus and stuff in here. So that's also uh, been changed up slightly. We got a weaponsmith area right here, of course, with the grindstone and some lava and stuff. Uh, if we get into some of these houses, you'll see some beds and some windows and stuff. Because obviously, in a desert, you don't really need windows to keep out the cold air so that's that uh, more beds in here so a lot, a lot of great variety this is really nice actually I like the way this is looking um, yeah it also incorporates the uh, the walls the sandstone walls we have some pillars of some cut sandstone and some terracotta with some torches on it uh, you can see the city center over here with the big well which is looking great we got the bell right here there's some miniature farms around here some other structures here there can also be like big desert towers uh, in some areas. Uh, here's some more houses over here. The next village type we have is actually a brand new village type. This is the Snowy Village. So if we look around here, yeah, you can see some different things uh, in this village compared to other villages. So, for instance, different materials can be used uh, in these builds compared to other builds. So here we have like some diorite. So there's some diorite stairs, some diorite blocks, some andesite. Uh, and this is actually a this is a uh, weaponsmith's uh, workstation right here, and also diorite walls here, so that's pretty interesting. That can naturally generate. We also have some snow blocks in here. Here we have a house made out of ice, so packed ice and blue ice. If we walk inside here, you'll see some beds and a furnace in there, so that's pretty cool. We also have uh, some spruce fences and some lanterns, which can spawn here, which provide lighting throughout this village. Uh, you can see, for instance, like this little farm here has a lantern here hanging above the water here to prevent the water from actually freezing because it is a cold biome and it will freeze if there is no lantern there. Uh, we also have some ice spikes here, some ice pillars in the center of town uh, right next to the bell which is actually also on ice. Uh, more lanterns right here in some areas. We got some nice little houses here with some beds and some some uh, chimneys and stuff over here. We also have igloo-like houses so 
These can also spawn in the snowy villages, so and there's some villagers in there, there's some beds in here, and there's another smaller one over on this side it looks like, so that's pretty cool. Uh, more <laughs> ice houses, here's another uh, farm variant, so lots of different variety of houses and structures and things. Um, yeah, I'm trying to look around and see if there's anything else. There's piles of snow blocks in some areas that they presumably cleared out. Uh, here's a nice area with a horse, and there's just like a water source in the middle. So this is also part of the village, and there's like a little fence gate in the front. So there you go, guys. That is the Snowy Village variants, And yeah, it just goes to show you that, you know, each village has a little bit of a different feel, a little bit of a different vibe to it, and uh, a couple of different unique blocks uh, that make up the structures uh, in the village itself. By the way, guys, just want to show you, if you place down a workplace block, so like this guy is unemployed here, if I place down a workplace block right here of a barrel, or maybe a couple barrels, yeah, there we go. Yeah, this guy turned into a fisherman, so now I can actually trade with him for stuff that a fisherman will trade will trade for. Uh, so, yeah, I think now is a good time to go ahead and jump into the trading aspect of uh, villagers. Alright, so as I showed previously, if you don't have a villager that can trade with you, he will shake his head like that whenever you right click on him. So those are the villagers that are currently unemployed and you can't trade with them. Uh, likewise, if you click on a nitwit, he does the same thing as I also showed. Uh, however, if you clicked on a villager with a profession, uh, you'll see, yeah, this guy is a farmer. So if I click on him, he has a couple of trades that we can do. So uh, we're going to trade with him. You can see he also is a novice at the moment. And you can also tell that by his little pocket. Uh, thing he has right here, so he has like a stone uh, bit on his pocket, and that thing will actually change as you trade with him. So this is actually going to be what changes here. So let's go in here and we'll grab some emeralds, and let's also grab some carrots to trade with. So we'll have some of those. So let's just trade with this guy a few times. So let's do one, and every time you see we trade with him, his level goes up. So this is his progress toward the next level, and yeah, his progress toward unlocking uh, additional trades down here. Um, so let's just do another carrot trade. And you'll see, uh, yeah, basically as we trade more with him, his level keeps going up. And then once we get to this level right here, you'll see he'll graduate from uh, novice to the next level. But let's just keep on doing this until... We get this trade locked, so you see we did that trade eight times, and then there's an X here, which means we can no longer do that trade. So now if I, uh, yeah, back out here, you can see particles appear, and his pocket has changed from stone to what looks like leather right there. Um, so yeah, now he is an apprentice, so that's what the apprentice level pocket looks like right there. Um, so now let's go ahead and do a few more of these. Let's just go ahead and do a bunch of these at once. And let's do, let's say, the bread one as well. Okay, and then we'll do, let's say, the pumpkin trade as well. So let's just grab this. Okay, so now he's upgraded to journeyman. And you'll see he has a gold uh, pocket now. So, yeah, that is the journeyman level. Uh, and then the next level, we go ahead and keep on doing this. So let's do, uh, let's see, I don't know. Uh, pumpkins and you'll see uh, he also has lowered trades now because we've been trading with him a lot uh, we've now developed a good reputation in the village and so yeah if you do that uh, yeah the prices will drop and conversely if you actually are bad to villagers like let's say I hit this guy you'll see now he raised prices on me so now instead of it was five pumpkins because I was being nice now it's seven pumpkins because I just hit him if I hit him again you'll see he's raising them higher and he just keeps raising them if you keep on <laughs> if you keep on hitting him. Um, so yeah, let's just go ahead and do some pumpkin trades here. There we go. And let's see if his price is actually lowered once again. Nope, he's keeping them high. He's keeping them high. So this guy is now leveled up to expert. So he has a few more trades now. He has some suspicious stew trades here that we can purchase like that. Uh, and yeah, let's see if he now. Levels up. Yep, he's now leveled up to Master, and Master is the final level. Uh, so you can see now he sells some other things down here with golden carrots, glistering melon slices, and things of that nature. So this farmer I've been trading with, as you can see, has a lot of his trades now locked. Uh, so say if I wanted to do this carrot trade again, you see I actually can't do it, and it says villagers restock up to two times per day. So, yeah, we actually have to wait for him to now go and restock uh, at his workstation, which is the composter. Uh, and once he restocks at the composter, 
uh, then we'll be able to trade with him again. And he can do that up to two times per day, so you can't just continually, continuously trade with villagers anymore. You actually have to wait until they go to work, restock their supplies, and then uh, come back, essentially. So, yeah, that can take a little bit of time sometimes. So, yeah, just be aware of that. Another interesting thing about villagers is that they will now show you what exactly they will trade for or exchange for in exchange for whatever you're holding. So if I hold an emerald in my hand, you can see this guy holds a piece of bread, which tells me he is actually selling bread. So if I look into his trades, you can see yeah, he's selling one emerald, uh, selling six bread for one emerald, I should say. So I can then do this trade here, and yeah, he continues to hold the bread as long as he has bread available, I believe. So if I just do that like so... Uh, he actually does not show the bread once the trade becomes locked. So you can see now, yeah, he's not showing it. Uh, however, he also will give you an emerald for 15 beetroot. So if I hold beetroot in my hand, you'll see he holds an emerald in his hand, and then I can go in and do the beetroot trade there. Uh, and yeah, buy him out of that. Uh, and now let's see if he resets. Let's see if he now... Yep, he's now offering pumpkin pie. So I can go in, and there's the pumpkin pie trade that he's offering. And he's also uh, selling emeralds for pumpkins. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. So you can see what they're going to offer in their hand uh, before you actually uh, go into the crafting window. So there's also a whole bunch of new trades in this update uh, with villagers. So you might have noticed some, like with this farmer villager, for instance, uh, who is also reset, by the way, now. Um, yeah, this farmer villager offers some suspicious stew now. He also offers now golden carrots, which he never did before, and also... Uh, some glistering melon slices, which you never did before. Uh, and also the, the baseline prices for things like melons, pumpkins, carrots, uh, pretty much everything has changed. <laughs> so, yeah, you'll have to go and explore a lot of these trades for yourself, but I want to highlight a few which uh, are sort of a, of note to me. Um, so, first off, we have banners. Banners are sold by cartographers and shepherds now. Uh, we also have cartographers selling globe patterns, uh, which aren't obtainable and aren't craftable otherwise. Uh, so, yeah, they can sometimes sell this globe pattern. Uh, the cartographer also sells things like uh, item frames, which are sometimes hard to come by. Uh, butcher buys uh, some sweet berries and also dried kelp. So those are somewhat useful. Uh, the fisherman sells campfires. So if you can't find, like, a Taiga village or, uh, yeah, you come across a fisherman, you can easily buy a campfire from him. Next up, the toolsmith, the armor, and the weaponsmith will all sell you the bell, so you don't have to steal the bell from a uh, village if you don't want to. So that is that. Uh, we have the butcher selling rabbit stew, which is also a really good food item. So that's uh, really good. It's only one emerald at the baseline cost. Uh, librarians selling uh, lanterns. That's pretty useful if you don't have iron early game. Uh, cleric buying some glass bottles is a pretty good trade. And also... Uh, Netherwort, as well as shoots from turtles, uh, from baby turtles growing up. Uh, masons. Masons are an interesting mob, an interesting villager. They buy uh, quartz. They also will sell you quartz blocks, uh, so you can get quartz without going to the nether. Uh, they also buy things like diorite, andesite, and granites. Uh, they sell you terracotta and the uh, glazed terracotta, so those are those. Then we have the Fletcher. The Fletcher is buying sticks, so that's a good trade there if you can get a lot of wood. Uh, they also sell you uh, tipped arrows of almost every type. So, yeah, Fletcher selling tipped arrows, so you don't have to go and get Dragon's Breath just to craft these up. Yeah, and then finally, the Librarian buys Ink Sack. So if you have a squid farm, that can be a good way to get emeralds for you. So those are just a few trades which you'll encounter uh, throughout the world. And there's a bunch of other new ones and a bunch of ones that have been repriced as well. So it's important to note that villagers have schedules throughout the day. So basically in the morning and throughout most of the afternoon, the villagers will go to work. They'll basically congregate around their workstation, which for the farmer is the composter. And the farmer will also like harvest crops and pick up crops and replant crops and things like that. Cartographer does the same at the cartography table. Mason does the same at the stonecutter, etc. Uh, so all the villagers basically go to work. And then once it gets to sort of like late afternoon, so like if I do time set 9,500, let's say, uh, we should now see most of the villagers come and congregate around this city center area where this bell is. Uh, and they do this to gossip. So yeah, these guys are gossiping right here, and we should see a couple other villagers make their way over to this area if they can. I think this guy can make it up. Yeah, he can make it up, so he's going to go up here as well. Yeah, you can see a couple other guys coming in, so 
Yeah, they're all sort of congregating here to gossip amongst one another. And this is important because at this point, uh, this is where they share the majority of their gossip during the day. And if they don't have an iron golem, which, let's see, do they have an iron golem right now? They do have an iron golem right over there, so uh, they will not spawn in another one. But if they didn't, and um, yeah, if they didn't have a golem within like an 80 by 80 radius, I think it is, um, they would then spawn in another another iron golem. So yeah, I think that is pretty cool. So yeah, the villagers actually like sort of talk to one another and have sort of like this meeting at uh, close to dusk, just before dusk. And then if it actually goes to night, so let's just do time set 12,400, like so. So yeah, the sun is now setting, so you'll see now the villagers now leave this sort of meeting point here with the bell. And they go to their houses to sleep. So like, for instance, this guy has gone into his house, and he's already in bed. He's out like a light. <laughs> so yeah, that guy went to bed. Uh, if we go in here... This guy looks like he has also gone to bed, so, yeah, these guys are now going to bed, and, yeah, these villagers are just going to search for uh, areas with a bed, and it's so, like, this guy might go into here, potentially, and sleep. Yep, there he goes, and he's and he's down, and he's down, so, yeah, they will then sleep through the entirety of the nights, uh, and, yeah, once the night has passed and all the villagers uh, have slept, then if we do time set day... They wake up, they pop out of bed, just like that, and now they're ready to go again. So now you should see them coming out of their houses like this, and they go back to work, and then they do it all over again. So that's sort of the village uh, schedule and village routine. By the way, speaking of iron golems, one iron golem will now spawn in in every village upon initial village generation. So you should find an iron golem uh, in every village, and if not, the villagers should congregate, gossip, and spawn in another one soon after the golem is gone. So baby villagers also have some unique behavior in this update. You can see they'll jump up and down on the beds uh, when given the chance. So yeah, there's some over here jumping on the bed and there's some over here also jumping on the bed. They also will run around and play as you can see here. So we got one group going that way, we got one group going this way, and then they just sort of scurry about chasing one another to and from in, uh, in various directions. So yeah, there they go, off to play. It's also important to note that there are zombified variants of all village types. So here you see a zombified desert village, and yeah, some structures have holes in the walls or in the ceilings, and there's a lot of cobwebs around here. And yeah, uh, these are basically the same as normal villages, except this one, for instance, was abandoned. Uh, when I got here, uh, there are still stray cats that spawn in these villages, but there's just no villagers uh, anywhere to be found, and... Yeah, there's just a lot of cobwebs and holes and, and structures. So uh, those are some zombie villages. And by the way, you can sometimes find uh, zombie villagers in these areas. Uh, so if I get out a zombie villager spawn egg, um, I didn't find any in this particular village, but they can uh, exist. And you'll note that, yeah, zombie villagers also have biome-dependent skins. Uh, and they also have professions. And yeah, there's the baby zombie. So yeah, they all have the sort of same uh, skin type as the desert villager, except obviously they're green zombies. Uh, and then the same thing happens if I go over here into the savannah. Uh, there's a zombie skin for a savannah zombie villager. So yeah, there's that one. Obviously he starts to burn because he's a zombie, but yeah, they actually have the zombie villager skins for all the different biomes. And let me see if I can actually find a zombie village which actually has zombie villages living in it. So here is another variant of the zombified villages. Uh, you can see this guy actually spawned in naturally here. That is a natural zombie villager. Uh, and I'm guessing that a lot of these guys are probably already either dead or about to die. So I'm just going to go around and see if I can find any of these guys here still alive. Nope. Doesn't look like it. So yeah, just the one... Just the one was alive, apparently. All the other ones have died. Nope, this guy's still alive. There he is. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. You can find zombie villages with uh, zombie villagers still alive, uh, such as this taiga one right here. But, yeah, they don't survive long during the daytime, obviously, because they burn up. So, yeah, that is that. And I'm curious. Yeah, it looks like you still have loot in these chests, which is the, still the same as uh, regular villages. So, yeah, there you go.
All right, guys, so we're now ready to talk about pillager raids. So pillager raids are what can occur when a certain number of things happen. Uh, the first thing that needs to happen is that you need to kill one of these pillager captains with the banner on their head. So if I just kill one of these guys, you will see that, yeah, when that happens, you saw the icon come up in there, and I have the bad omen effect on me uh, right now. So once I have this bad omen effect, this bad omen effect stays around for quite some time. And then if you have the bad omen effect and you go into a village, that will actually trigger the raid. There are actually multiple levels of the bad omen effect, so if I kill another pillager captain, uh, you'll see my bad omen level increases to bad omen level 2. And this can increase all the way up to bad omen level 6. And basically, the bad omen level, uh, the higher it goes, the higher percentage chance that mobs like pillagers and vindicators in the raids will have enchanted uh, bows and enchanted uh, axes. So, yeah, that's what that does. And also, if you have a bad omen level greater than 1, uh, when you go into a village and a raid occurs, you'll also get a bonus wave beyond the uh, default uh, number of raid waves. So by default, the number of raid waves that take place during a raid uh, is determined by the difficulty of the world. So on easy difficulty, you get three raid waves. On normal, you get five. And on hard, you get seven raid waves, plus any bonus uh, raid waves will be added onto those things. So right now with this bad omen two, I'll actually get eight raid waves. Um, so let's head over to a nearby village and let's see some raids. Okay, so let's go ahead and go into a village with the bad omen effect here, and you can see, yeah, immediately when I come into the village, the villagers all start to panic, and they're scurrying about. Um, you'll see some of them <laughs> looking for places to hide, basically. Uh, some of them might try to ring this bell, actually. Not sure if they can actually reach it or not, but they will try to get near it and actually uh, touch it in some instances. Um, so, yeah, you can see they're also now sweating. As you can see, those water particles coming off of them. Because they're kind of nervous, because this raid is, n is now coming in. So, yeah, this is the first raid wave. Uh, so, yeah, pretty small raid wave. Uh, looks like we got some Vindicators here and some Pillagers. So, obviously, they try and kill all of the Villagers. And if there was a Golem nearby, they, the Golem would be helping out here. Um, so, yeah, we're going to see how this raid goes here. And by the way, one of the things you can do during a raid is hit the bell, which I showed previously, but this actually highlights all mobs in the raid, so that actually helps a lot in figuring out where certain mobs are. And you see the pillagers can actually open doors, or the vindicators can open doors, uh, and yeah, they can just basically go right into the houses and yeah, look for villagers. So there are two outcomes for raids. One is that, yeah, the pillagers win, so if the pillagers win, you can see he jumps up and down, and they celebrate with some different sounds. So, yeah, that raid defeat means that all villagers are dead, and that, yeah, basically the village has been conquered, effectively. So, yeah, these guys are all celebrating. He has his arms in the air triumphantly, so, <laughs> yeah, that that's actually pretty cool. So, yeah, the, uh, the pillagers have won, and, yeah, the raid has succeeded. So that's what happens if the... Villagers all die, and basically you don't defend them and stuff like that, so... <laughs> yeah, now let's go to another village, uh, get the bad omen effect again, and we'll see what happens when uh, you actually win a raid. Alright guys, so we have the bad omen 3 effect. We're gonna go into a village right over here and attempt to win uh, the raid battle, and I'll show you what happens once we win, and also show you some of the, uh, the waves of mobs along the way, because we should get a full uh, 8 waves of mobs here. So yeah, you can see... Villagers panicking and everything, and we should see some raids start happening momentarily once the bar gets all the way filled up. Alright, so raid wave number one, Vindicators and Pillagers coming in here. And the Golem, of course, going after some of these guys here as well. And I'm just going to help them out a little bit here, so there we go. So two mobs remaining, one mob remaining, and there's the last guy getting taken out by the Golem. So there we go, one wave down, so yeah. We got seven more waves to go. Okay, so the raid bar is filling back up, and let's see what happens here with the next wave and see where it spawns at. Looks like it's spawning over there across the river, 
And so with the second wave, the Ravager can actually start to spawn in, but it looks like we did not get one this time. Um, so yeah, these guys are all just sort of sitting ducks here in this area. So let's just go ahead and take all these guys out while we're here. There we go. All right, looks like we did get a Ravager here. So yeah, here's the third wave coming in. And yeah, it looks like, yeah, just, yeah, just the Ravager here. Uh, one other cool thing I want to point out about these raids, if you actually kill the raid captain, this guy, take a look. So the next guy comes over, picks up the banner, and assumes the helm of the captain. So it's like a continuous like leadership thing right there, so that's pretty cool. Um, let's go ahead and take out these dudes here, and there went the Ravager, taken out by the Golem. And now it's going to be the fourth wave. The fourth wave we can now start to see other mobs start to spawn in a little bit more frequently, like witches uh, in a support role. Witches will throw regeneration potions, which heal other mobs, which, yeah, you can see right there. So witches are now throwing in some regeneration potions. So let's come in here. We'll take these dudes out. Take these guys out. And the witches are indeed part of the raids, so got to be careful of them as well. So, yeah, we'll just take all these guys out. So now we're ready for the fifth wave. So the fifth wave can actually, you can actually start to see evokers start to spawn in. So that's when things really start to get serious. All right, fifth wave coming in, and we do have an evoker. And also you can tell the number of mobs are now increasing in these raids. Uh, we also have a pillager riding a ravager over there. So that is also another thing we have to be aware of. And you see, yeah, the... Uh, the Evoker drops the Totem of Undying, so this is actually a way to get Totems of Undying now uh, renewably in survival. So let's just go ahead and take this dude out here. Took this guy out, take that guy out. This Pillager's over here. Here's the Captain. Let's take the Captain out, there we go. That guy's going for the banner. You'll see he assumes the mantle of Captain now. Sixth raid wave, it looks like they have gotten caught up a little bit here, so I'm going to come over here and start slaying while I still can, so yeah. There's a lot of pillagers and vindicators in this area. And yep, that was it, so that was a pretty weak sixth raid, honestly. Alright, so seventh raid wave. This one should be pretty bad, we should be able to see multiple evokers in this one. Uh, let's see if we can see it. Uh, yep, right over here. Okay, so we got, yep, two evokers right there who are coming in quite quickly. So we'll just take these guys out. Drops the totem of undying, obviously. And let's just get these guys coming up here. So we'll just take all these guys out. We also have two ravagers coming up, so yeah. There's also an evoker riding a ravager, so that's another thing we gotta contend with. Witches again down here healing up, so yeah, things get kind of chaotic in these final few layers. Uh, looks like we got one guy who made it past us, so we'll just take this dude out. There we go, and there's still one guy somewhere right over here. And let's see, where did he go? He's right here, so let's just take this dude out. So there we go. Alright, so now we're in the final wave raid. Uh, so if we... Defeat this raid wave coming up, this eighth one, uh, since we had an extra bonus uh, wave, basically, since we had a high, higher omen level than one. Um, then we will win uh, the the battle, basically. So, looks like they're coming in over here. Yeah, again, a lot of evokers. We have some ravagers. We have some witches. So, yeah, this is a pretty bad wave. Pretty bad uh, raid wave. So, let's just get out here. We're going to start slaying these guys. Try to not let anybody through. There we go. We'll take down the beast. Actually, there's three beasts there. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, there were actually a lot of beasts there. And you see, yeah, the Vindicator's going in, opening doors. This Evoker has actually started to spawn stuff in here. And so the raid is almost over. We just got to get one more guy down, I think. Nope. Still a few more. A few stragglers. All right, so I'm not sure where this last guy is. You'll see if I ring the bell here. Nothing shows up. But if I come over here and ring the bell, maybe... Yep, right there. So there's the last raider. Somehow got lost in the lake over here. Not sure how he ended up here, but 
We'll just do this. And then that should be it. You'll see raid victory. So now the villagers should come out of their houses and boom. Firework effect is seen. So yeah, the, anytime they're outside and they don't have a block over their head, they'll shoot off fireworks. So that is absolutely fantastic to see. A little fireworks show throughout the village. And yeah, they all come back out and sort of celebrate. So that is really cool. And if I do game mode survival like this, yeah, now when I go around the village, uh, you'll see that villagers will actually gift me things. So they'll actually, like, throw stuff at me. So let me just clear my inventory here so you can see what sort of stuff I get. Because there is quite a number of different items we can get uh, with this Hero of the Village effect. Yep, so you just saw it right there. The cleric just threw me some redstone. So we got some redstone dust from the cleric. That is awesome. Let me come on into the main part of town now, see what else we can get from these villagers as they express their gratitude for me saving their city. We got some seeds from an unemployed villager. And all these guys here are unemployed, so I think the unemployed guys just give you pretty much seeds and that's it. Let's see, we got a farmer here. Farmer gave us a cookie, so you get some free food from the farmer. So there's a bunch of other items you can get from villagers, and yeah, this Hero of the Village effect lasts for about two in-game days. Also, when you defeat the raid and get the Hero of the Village effect, uh, you get some major discounts on trades. Uh, in addition to being showered with the gifts, uh, including like things like poppies from baby villagers. Um, so, yeah, let's go ahead and just sort of demonstrate this effect here. So, right here I've actually had a good reputation going with this guy. He's giving me a little bit of a discount here. Uh, nine clay for an emerald. But let's see what happens if I go ahead and add the effect uh, of the Hero of the Village. So, I'll give myself... Hero of the Village, and I'll do it with uh, level 1 for 10 seconds. Let's see. So now, if I go in, I have paying 6 for 1. I have 13 for 1 Emerald here and 11 here. Uh, and you'll see, uh, now if I go back in without the effect, prices have gone back up. So uh, now let's try it with, uh, let's say, uh, let's do, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's do level 5, which is the highest obtainable in survival. So now you can see I'm only paying 3 clay for an emerald, 7 stone for an emerald, 6 granite for an emerald, which is really good prices. So you get massive discounts the higher level of uh, the Hero of the Village you obtain. Uh, and I believe that is basically determined by the level of bad omen you come into the village with. Uh, at least that's as far as I can tell. So now on to world generation changes. Some of these you may have seen before in this video, but I want to go over these as its own section because there is some changes that I might not have talked about. So first of all, we have ourselves some bamboo. Bamboo now spawns in jungles, so be on the lookout for this. They're only like a couple of shoots every few hundred blocks. So there's one over there, for instance. Uh, there's a couple, there's one over there. So yeah, they're kind of sparse, but they do now spawn in jungles in small shoots. And there's also a couple of new biomes that are jungle related. So over here we have the bamboo jungle biome, as you can see. So if I go ahead and hit F3, yeah, bamboo jungle biome. And this bamboo jungle biome obviously lives up to its name. There's a ton of bamboo in here. And also on the floor there is a lot of podzol. So this is a new area where you can get podzol here. Um, and yeah, there's also melons that can spawn in the bamboo jungle. And over here... Uh, you can also see that there are jungle temples which can spawn in bamboo jungles. So you can find these structures now in the bamboo jungle. Finally, you can also usually find pandas frequently in the bamboo jungles. They also spawn in the regular jungles, but not quite as frequently. So yeah, here's one panda, for example, right here living in the bamboo jungle. We also have some new structures in this update. So let's take a look at this one right here. This is the Pillager Outpost. So pillager outposts are somewhat rare and they spawn nearby villages. Uh, they can spawn anywhere between 100 and 1500 blocks away from villages uh, and only in biomes that also uh, have villages. So only in savanna, desert, plains, taiga, snowy tundra, and snowy taiga biomes. Uh, that's the only place you'll find these outposts. Now the outposts themselves are made of basically the same scheme of blocks which make up a woodland mansion. And they also have these illager banners on the outside. Uh, if we take a look at the structure itself and go on inside here, you can see there's a front entrance where there should be a door, but there is not a door there. Uh, and yeah, we can go on in. You can see this is the first level here with some windows. And then there's this central 
staircase that goes up to the second floor, which is also somewhat open, and pillagers can sort of shoot out at the player uh, if they uh, see a player coming. Then the staircase continues up to this next floor here, which is somewhat empty, and then to the top floor here, where they have the sort of like main platform, and also there's a chest up here with some goodies in it uh, that you can raid. So that is the pillager outpost tower, and of course around the tower, lots of pillagers and pillager captains spawn. Uh, you can also have other structures around this outpost, although none spawned in in this instance. Um, so, yeah, you can sometimes have, like, tents or cages or targets. And occasionally, you can have iron golems, which also spawn here uh, inside the cages. So if you see that, make sure and go and free the golems, because they'll start to fight for you uh, and fight off some of these pillagers in the nearby vicinity. Next up we have new flower generation. So one new flower is the corn flower. This can spawn in the plains, which I'm in right now, as well as sunflower plains and flower forest. So we are now in the flower forest biome, and in addition to a bunch of corn flowers, you might also be able to see a couple of the lily of the valley flowers. And this is the only place in the world where lily of the valleys grow. So probably the biggest change to world generation is obviously the villages, so obviously every biome has its own uh, village type now with different materials that the buildings are made out of, different styles of builds, and the villages themselves are all laid out differently now with different pathways and different uh, sort of secondary structures besides just the houses and things. Uh, there's also new blocks in these villages as well. Uh, some of which can uh, only be found in certain biomes, but I went over all that already in the villagers section, so if you want to check that out, that is in section 3 of this video. One final minor world generation change is that sweet berries can be found in the taiga biome, and you can also find sweet berries inside of taiga villages sometimes as well, as you can see right here. A nice little patch right here. And these can also sometimes be found inside the chests in the villages as well. So now on to miscellaneous changes in the game this update. First of all, you can shoot chorus fruit flowers from the tops of chorus fruit plants now with an arrow. So if I just shoot it like that, you see it pops right off and comes right on down like so. And I believe this also works with crossbows. Let me just check it out. So if I shoot that, yep, there it is right there. So I can just run on over and pick it up uh, without having to actually pillar up to it. Uh, and this also does work with tridents as well. So. There we go, we got the trident back, and here is our chorus flower right there. There are a couple of new advancements that you can earn in this update, and if we go into advancements here, you can see they are Voluntary Exile, where you kill a raid captain, uh, and it tells you basically stay away from villages unless you want to uh, get a raid going on. And there's also a Hero of the Village advancement, where you successfully defend a village from a raid. Uh, there are also a few other crossbow advancements, so one is just simply shooting a crossbow. Uh, one is to kill two phantoms with a single piercing arrow. Uh, one is to basically kill a pillager with a crossbow, and the other one is the hardest one by far, I think, and that is to kill five unique mobs with one crossbow shot. So that actually requires uh, piercing four to be able to even attempt that one. There's also one more advancement, and that is a complete catalog, and you get that if you tame all 11 types of cats in the game now. Also, this is probably the biggest change in the game in this update, but basically every block in the game has had some type of retouch or retexture, so yeah, if I just scroll through here, you can see, like, for instance, the fern looks totally different than it did previously. Uh, a lot of the uh, ore blocks, like the diamond block and the gold block and things, look different. The glowstone looks different. The melon looks different. Uh, and that is part of a larger retexture. The glass is a little bit clearer now, uh, which I really like. So, yeah, I'm not going to go over that in too much detail. But, yeah, just know that every uh, texture in the game has basically changed at least a little bit. By the way, in case for some reason you don't like the new textures, which I absolutely love, they definitely do grow on you, so I highly recommend you guys try them out. But if you absolutely can't stand them, uh, there is a way to go back. So if you go to Options, Resource Packs, and you should have this, Programmer Art, the classic look of Minecraft. If you click on that, then click Done, you'll see the Mojang symbol loads up. And then all the textures will be back to normal. So yeah, you can see all the textures have been reverted. And these are how they were previously. Uh, and then of course to go back, all you have to do is just the reverse. So just take this Programmer Art and put it back on the other side. Click Done. And now you're going to be back to the 1.14 new textures, which I think are definitely superior.
One of the biggest changes, in my opinion, to Minecraft 114 is the added support for directional opacity of blocks. And what that means for you in survival is that things like light can be now a little bit more tricky to hide. So, for instance, uh, they added a uh, opaque face to the uh, enchantment table, whereas before it was totally transparent. Uh, so what that means is now if you have an enchantment table over a glowstone, you'll see it totally blocks the light from that glowstone. Uh, and yeah, basically before in 113, uh, we had a situation where light would go straight through it. And yeah, you could have uh, basically a, a free light source under the enchantment table. So that is now gone. Uh, also, I know a lot of people use pistons for hidden lighting in uh, survival Minecraft, uh, especially with like wooden floors. Uh, that is also no longer possible due to this change. So yeah, the opaque uh, face of the... Uh, the piston uh, prevents that. And same thing if you put the piston on its side, it still doesn't uh, prevent that. Uh, you can also place the piston facing down like this. And that also blocks it as well. So, yeah, that's a pretty big change. Uh, and also, uh, slabs and stairs. This applies to those as well. So, if you've made a dark room with slabs or with stairs where you have a gap you can look through where light can't get through, uh, light can now get through that gap. Uh, so, yeah, previously this would not allow any light through at all, but now as you can see, it clearly does. However, there are some benefits to this, including the fact that beacon beams can now go through things like slabs and stairs, as you can see right here. You can now climb vines like this, even if there's no supporting blocks for those vines. On hard difficulty, villagers will now revert to zombie villagers 100% of the time. So if I go ahead and put down a zombie here, you'll see this guy, after getting hit a few times by the zombie, will go into zombie villager mode. Uh, and by the way, here are his trades before he converts. So coal 15 for 1, and then he has a iron sword trade with smite 2 on it for 21. So keep those in mind before he converts. Okay, so yeah, now he is a zombie villager right here. Uh, and let's go ahead and just slay the other villager. So we'll get out an axe and slay this guy. Alright, so now we're going to convert this guy back into a regular villager. So we're going to hit him with the weakness potion and, of course, a golden apple. And now we just wait a little bit of time. And there we go. So the villager has now successfully been cured from the zombie plague. And yeah, you see the particles around him. And not only that, uh, if we right click on him here, you can see, yeah, he now has the same trades. So 15 coal for an emerald, 21 emeralds for a smite to iron sword. Plus he's given us a little bit of a discount for saving him from being a zombie. So that is pretty cool. A splash water bottle can put out a campfire. And as you'd expect, in addition to flint and steel, you can also use fire charges to light campfires. Falling entities like sand, gravel, concrete powder, and red sand will no longer be able to float above blocks that are taller than one and a half blocks. And instead, you can see they actually land directly on top of, say, for instance, a wall or a fence uh, with no gap in between. We also have six new note block sounds added in this update. First of all, if you place a note block over an iron block, it will play a xylophone sound. Just like that. And of course it has all the notes going up like that. Uh, next up we have soul sand. Note block over soul sand will get you a cowbell sound. Just like that. And that. Next we have the pumpkin, so no block over a pumpkin will give you a didgeridoo sound. So there's that one. We have the emerald block. Emerald block gives a bit sound. There you go. And next up the hay bale. Hay bale gives a banjo sound. There you go, just like so. And then finally the glowstone. The glowstone gives a pling sound. TNT now has a 100% drop rate. So for instance, if I put like some diamonds and some redstone right next to this, maybe some iron as well, and then shoot it with a flame bow, you will see that, there we go, once it's lit, 
There we go. It explodes and it drops all blocks that it destroys, including the ore blocks. So there's redstone, there's iron, there's diamond, and there's the dirt and stuff that it destroyed as well. And so the same thing is true of TNT minecarts. So if I put a couple blocks down here and then shoot this with the flame bow, you'll see, yep, there it went. Yeah, and yeah, it actually dropped all the blocks here, uh, which it destroyed in this radius. One of the biggest under the radar changes in 114 is that tamed wolf kills now count as player kills. So this has a lot of big implications, especially like with wither skeleton farms. Uh, you can now make those fully automatic once again by using tamed wolves. Uh, same thing with uh, slaying, for instance, stray skeletons. You can get slowness arrows now from dog kills and things like that. Uh, you can also get, you know, like rare drops from uh, skeletons like bows and stuff. Uh, which you normally wouldn't get, and same thing with zombies with, like, potatoes and iron ingots. But, uh, since, yeah, tamed wolf kills now count as player kills, you can also get the, uh, the bad omen effect from these pillager captains when your dog kills them. So I'll just show you, if I go into game mode survival here, uh, maybe, like this, there we go, and let my dog run here, and I'll shoot this guy here, and let the dog do the kill. You'll see here, even though I don't actually kill the guy, the dog does, I still get the bad omen effect. So, yeah, be very aware of that, because if you're not aware of that, and you pass by one of these outposts, and your dog automatically kills one of these pillagers, and then you go to a village, you might be rather surprised when a raid comes. So, yeah, just be aware that tamed wolf kills are now player kills. Wither skeletons and zombie pigmen will now track through lava to reach the player, as you can see right here that they are doing. You can now get god tier level enchantments on your armor in survival, because you can now put multiple levels of protection on one piece of armor, whereas before they were mutually exclusive, so I'll just show you here if I want to put like protection 4 on this chest piece. Previously you couldn't put something like fire protection 4 on as well, but now as you can see you can. And you can just keep on stacking these, so I'll put projectile protection on there as well, and blast protection as well, just like that. And so now I have a chest piece with all types of protection. Now if you look at an enderman and an enderman becomes angry, you'll see that the enderman continues to, yeah, just basically stare back at you until you eventually break your uh, stare at the enderman itself, and then the enderman comes to attack you. You can now place things like redstone dust, buttons, levers, repeaters, ladders, vines, uh, trip wires, uh, coral fans, uh, pressure plates on a bunch of transparent blocks including glass, ice, uh, sea lanterns, glowstone, uh, even like beacons and things like that. So if I place uh, redstone dust on a beacon like that, I can do that. Uh, if I want to place like a lever on the side of it, I can do that. Uh, if I wanted to place a lever on top of a closed trap door, I can do that now too. Same with dust right here and a button over here, although it does pop off when you update it like that. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And also the redstone, when viewed from below through glass or stained glass, is actually invisible. So that can be useful for something as well. You can now shift into one and a half block tall spaces just by holding shift like this. And yeah, you actually don't have to continue to shift once you're under a one and a half block tall space. Uh, and then you will readjust once you come back out. Uh, this becomes most apparent when you're in a one block space. So if I open this trap door, close it on myself, I can then walk straight through here. Uh, it doesn't matter that I'm in creative mode, you can do this in survival mode too. Uh, so yeah, you can easily make it down this tunnel like this, and then you automatically adjust when you come back out. Uh, it's a little bit more apparent what's happening when I'm in F5 mode, so if I close this here, there we go, player adjusts, I can then go through the tunnel like so, and then I'll come back out this way, and you'll see the player will adjust to being two blocks tall once again, so there you go. So ladies and gentlemen, those are all the survival relevant changes to Minecraft 1.14, the village and pillage update. If you enjoyed this update video and want to see more like this in the future, please do leave a like button. This video also took a long time to put together, so a like would be very much appreciated. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this, be sure to subscribe if you haven't done so already. But for now, guys, that is it for the Ultimate Survival Guide for Minecraft 1.14. Thanks again for watching. This has been Cub. Goodbye.